Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents times I hear that sound, it still sends a chill down my spine. You know it's a police car or ambulance on the way to or from an emergency in which someone is badly hurt. At Mercy Hospital, not everyone arrives with the shriek of a siren. Most arrive quietly with the help of a relative or friend. Some come alone, hoping against hope that the grasping pain around the heart is only indigestion. A few come under their own power, sheer willpower that keeps them conscious against all of the body's desire to give up, but hoping, as we always hope, that the bell has not yet tolled for us. Hear that, Chief? Oh, Dr. Grant? Siren. Oh, I hope it isn't one of our ambulances. Well, ten to one it is. There's one of those nights an emergency when... Help. 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 All right, Toby, give me a... Give me a hand. Yes. Orderly, get that rolling cart. Oh, he's heavy. He's just about unconscious. Where are you hurt, sir? Stop it. Stop it. It's all right, Orderly. Take him from Dr. Grant and let's get him on the cart. Easy now. On his back. Gently. What is it, Dr. Peterson? Appendix? Oh, you won't ask me that. Now I've opened his jacket. Look at that blood on his shirt. What is it, then? Get me some swabs. This man's been shot. Our mystery drama, The Witness is Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Joan Shea and Ken Harvey. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. You've seen the Budweiser commercials on television, and maybe you've wondered how long people have been putting that famous Bud label on things. Well, not as long as the brewers of Bud have been putting things on the label. Things like a list of Bud's most important ingredients. Quote, brewed by our original process from the choicest hops, rice, and best barley malt. And things like the following statement. 
This is the famous Budweiser beer. We know of no brand produced by any other brewer, which costs so much to brew and age. Our exclusive Beechwood aging produces a taste, a smoothness, and a drinkability you will find in no other beer at any price. Unquote. Yes, brewing beer right does make a difference. Read the Bud label. Taste the king of beers. And you'll agree, when you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Save a little and save a lot more at the Northwest Federal General Store. That's where you'll find a giant cracker barrel of gifts. Gifts for savers by famous makers we all know. The Sunbeam Hand Mixer, the Schick Style Dryer, a Presto Pressure Cooker and Wearing Blender. And they're all free or priced for special savings when you save $250 or more. See them all in our newspaper ads. And now you can save at three centers of interest in the great Northwest Territory, on Irving Park Road, on Dempster Street in Des Plaines, and now in Norwich in the Harlem Irving Plaza. So save where you get the highest interest rates allowed by law. And get free gifts, too. From the Cracker Barrel of Gifts, now at Northwest Federal Savings. But come in soon. Some styles and colors are limited. One gift per family, please. Offer good for a limited time only. Remember, it's Northwest Federal Savings Time, 63 hours a week. A man has been shot. How? Why? Who is he? By whom was he shot? A jealous husband? A jealous wife? In anger or cold-bloodedly? Sheer accident? Or with malice aforethought? All these questions must wait as Dr. Brian Peterson works quickly and deftly, knowing this man is on the borderline between life and death and trying to find out who he is. <laughs> Can you, uh, can you give us your name, sir? I don't, I don't know. You don't know your name? No. Who, who shot? Rip open the rest of his shirt and get your oh. stethoscope on his heart. Yes. We see how he's doing. It will do. Sir, can you hear me? No. Damn, he wasn't shot all that recently. He must have hemorrhaged internally like mad. Orderly, you and the nurse take him straight to emergency. Alert Dr. Aiello. We're going to need anesthesia. He doesn't look like the kind of man to get mixed up in his shooting. Mm, looks can be deceiving, as you'll find out, M.S., in turn. Is he going to die? Oh, not as long as he's breathing. Nurse, get me some gloves. I want a good look at that bullet wound. Swab off the area again, Dr. Oh. <laughs> yeah. See the wound? Yes. It's small. Definitely point of entry. Just one shot. That's all I see. All right, thank you, Nurse. Oh, uh, get me a probe and some retractors. Thank you. Now, let's have a better look. It was no toy bullet. Heavy 38 could be a police special. And the bullet's still inside. All right, get us an emergency OR, Doctor. We're going to have to go in. Doctor, should you risk operating without a release? I mean, who knows who this man is? Oh, we have information. We know he's white, male, and from his hands, I'd, I'd say some kind of workman. The police will have to take it from there. Murder. Someone tried to murder. It's all right, sir. We are doctors. You're mm. in a hospital, and you're safe now. What's your name? Name. Name. No... I don't remember. I don't remember nothing except tried murder. Okay, Toby, go call the police. Then come up to OR. You can scrub and assist me on this one. Any change? Well, he's holding on. You got the police? Yes, they're on their way. They have an idea who our mystery patient might be. Happy. The sooner we get that bullet out of his insides, the happier I'll be. It's behind his spleen, resting on the spine. You say the police think they know who he is? Yes, a man named Roy Richardson. That name mean anything to you? Of course. <laughs> Don't you dames ever read the papers? 
course not, Doctor. We're always too busy curling our hair or recoloring our nails. Oh, don't get your back up. Well, then stop looking down your nose. I happen to have been on duty 60 hours out of the last 72. No, I haven't read the papers. Who is Roy Richardson? You know who Augie Larch is. Well, he'd be a little hard to miss. Our big-time racketeer who got nailed on income tax evasion and is about to go on trial? Yep, you know why. Oh, because someone in his organization was willing to turn state's evidence in order to... (gasps) Roy Richardson. That's the guy's name. Yeah. He's a witness. If we can bring him through. Yeah? Hockey? Yeah, who's this? Johnny A. Johnny Angel. Where are you? The hospital. You know that. You dropped me after we fought. Okay, okay. I just had to be sure. Your phone safe? Yeah, yeah. It's a public phone right here. What are you holding a big yap? Just give me the number. I'll call you back on a safe phone. Suction. Cut off that leader, Toby. Retractor. Clamp. Tied off, Dr. Peterson. Yeah, that's a little better. Now we can see what... Oh, oh there's the trouble. It's a big slug with lots of velocity. Must have bounced around plenty. Uh-huh. Bullet forceps, nurse. There's the baby. <laughs> yeah, 38, all right. Uh-huh. Soft-nosed. I just hope we don't have too many intestinal perforations. <laughs> Hold on to that, nurse. Please want it. I don't see any damage to the vital organs. Mr. Richardson is still going to be lucky to pull out of this one. And even if he does, to stay alive. One way or another. Mercy Hospital? It's okay, Augie. It's me. It's Johnny A. Okay. What's the scoop? They're operating on him now. Yeah, did he talk? I don't think so. He barely made it in the door. I saw the lock, but couldn't get to him in time. Is he gonna make it? I got no way of knowing. Well, you better make sure he don't. Augie. I do here in the hospital. You better figure that luck never comes to. He can nail me and I don't intend to be nailed. But if I should be, you better know you're a deep six. But Augie... Don't talk. Move. I'm going to give you a safe number you can contact me through. And if you need Gus, I'll send him to you. If that fink's mouth has got to be shut, let Gus handle it. That dummy is expendable. Only you back him up and make sure. Come in. Dr. Peterson? Oh, yes. Detective Sergeant Sam Marshall. Oh, how are you, Detective? I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, but I... I just got down from the operating room. How's your patient? Good constitution. He came through a very tough operation very well. He's going to live then? Well, I... Can't tell you that. The next 24 hours will tell. I understand he was in no condition to talk when he got here. Hmm? That's right. Or give his name? That's right. Just something about murder. But I had a notion from Dr. Grant, who reported the bullet one, that you had a pretty fair idea who he was. Well, we know that a witness in a trial due to start next week against Augie Larch disappeared last night. Or at least somewhere between midnight and eight this morning. Roy Richardson. Yeah. We've been keeping his picture out of the papers to protect him. It looks as if you didn't do a very good job of that, Sergeant. Richardson was the one who ducked us. Uh, is this the man you operated on, Dr. Peterson? Well, no. No, I've never seen this man before in my life. Uh, that's the way a cop's life goes, Doc. Now I've got to open a new file. Who the devil is your John Doe? Well, we found no identification on him. Looks like that's your problem, unless... Unless what? Well, unless... (laughs) I guess everyone can't resist trying to play cop, Sergeant. But when this man got to the hospital, he'd been carrying that slug in him for some time. Huh? I don't see how he could have made it on his feet for so long unless... Uh Uh-oh. What is it? Look down there. 
Uh, the parking lot for the hospital. Huh? See that car down there? Huh? Next to my red convertible? Is that yours? No. I hope I can do a better job of parking than that. Anyway, isn't that space reserved for doctors? Yes, but it's also right near the emergency entrance. Come on, Sergeant. Maybe we can find out the easy way who Mr. Roy Richardson isn't and just how he's mixed up in this. There's blood all over the seat. Don't touch the wheel, Doctor. You find anything? Registration for the car. Joseph C. Wilson, 1440, 4 of L Avenue. Height, 5'11", 1 half. Weight, 170. Eyes, blue, gray. Hair, light brown, age 36. Sound familiar? Yes, that could be the man I operated on. Description, Fitz. Mm-hmm. Apex Insurance. In case of accident, notify Mrs. Joseph Wilson. Let's go do that little thing, Doctor. You, uh... You know this, Wilson? I mean, was he another witness? Never heard of him. But I'd give a lot for a few words with him. Richardson is still missing, and my hunch is any deal he thought he could make with Augie Larch was one way. The odds are that Richardson is already at the bottom of some convenient lake. The big question is, did they intend to dump Mr. Wilson there, too? Or was he one of them and something went wrong? Either way, you've got to help me get something out of the guy. We had Augie Larch just where we wanted him. And I don't want to see him get off the hook. All they that take the sword shall perish by the sword. Is Joe Wilson's fate just retribution? Or is he an innocent victim? Is he another unfortunate possessor of information about the illegal operations of a ruthless criminal? Or is he something else entirely? Someone with no contact at all with Augie Larch, and yet who is infinitely more dangerous to him. I'll return shortly with Act Two. Give your hand to a friend. Give your heart to your love. But give your cold to contact. Six or three or one. Please don't give me problems. I'm catching a common cold. (laughs) Sneezing, drips, congestion. Give your cold a contact. For up to 12 hours continuous relief of those symptoms, you'd need six cold tablets, two every four hours, or three ounces of cold liquid, one every four hours, or just one contact. I know the tiny time pills. Right. Both the others are things for aches and fever. And the liquid, something for coughs, not found in contact. Your cold, your choice. Sneezing, drips, congestion. I'll take the contact. Give your cold to contact. The sooner the better. Six or three or one. Take contact. Only as directed. The Marine Corps Reserves are looking for a few good men to help keep the peace. looking for men who understand that nobody likes to fight, but somebody has to know how. We want men who want to see their children grow up in an age of peace, men who will do more than wish for it, men who will work for it, men who don't need the draft to know there's a job to be done, men who ask themselves what they can do for their country and do it. We're looking for a few good men to stand with the Marine Corps Reserve. No shortcuts, no compromises, no promises except one. You'll be a Marine, and you'll be ready. That's the job of a peacekeeper. the hospital in the intensive care unit lies the man for whom we seem to have found a name. But while the doctors monitor and fight to save the patient's life, Detective Sergeant Sam Marshall doggedly follows his job of finding out if he really is Joseph C. Wilson. And if he is, who he is, what he is, and what led him to being the target of a perhaps lethal bullet. 
As soon as the necessary police machinery has been set in motion, he goes personally to interview Joe's wife, Helen. And I was frantic. I was just going to call you. The police, I mean. Mm. Now you... Now you tell me this is... How could anyone ever shoot my Joe? Well, the point is, somebody did, Mrs. Wilson. <laughs> now, I've seen a picture of him. There's no doubt it's your husband. But why? Joe didn't have any enemies. Well, not that kind, anyway. Uh, what does your husband do for a living? He, he's a plumber. Does he have a partner? Work for a firm? No, or... no, he's just in business for himself. Uh, does he stay out much nights? Oh, not Joe. Outside of his work, the kids and me are his whole life. How many children do you have? Two. Mm -hmm. Ronnie, he's eight, and, and the baby, Sue Carroll, she, she's three. Uh, how come he went out last night? Well, it, it, it was an emergency call. No, from whom? Oh, yes. The Bensons, up on Long Ridge Road. They're, well, they're old customers and kind of friends, so that's why he went out so late. Uh, would there be any reason for him to come back by the old high road? Yes. Yes, he's stubborn about some things. It's a shortcut, but... But what... You know, I've asked him not to use it. There are so many blind curves, and it twists, and it's narrow, and it's all full of potholes. And, but nobody uses it much since it's so deserted. And since you... If, if you do meet someone coming the other way, it's so easy to have an accident. <laughs> I was always afraid. Now he's had one. Please, I, I want to go to my husband. I, I want to talk to him. Morning, Mr. Wilson. I'm Dr. Peterson. How am I doing, Doc? Thanks to a good, strong constitution, fine. You got any pain? Uh, some. Helen. Does Helen know about me? Yes. What happened? Oh, just that you were shot. That's all any of us knows yet. There um, is a detective of police down in my office who no. would like to... Uh, no. I, I want to see my, my wife first. Uh, yes, she's right outside. Nurse, you can get Mrs. Wilson and bring her in. Doc. Yes? Could I uh, see her alone for a minute? Well, if you... Um... If you promise not to overexcite yourself, I don't want to scare you, but you're a long way from being out of the woods yet. Uh, I promise. Joe. Joe, darling. Helen, baby. You all right, honey? Uh, oh, me. I can eat anything, even all that slug. <laughs> well, I'll give you two a moment alone. Come on, nurse. Joe, what happened? Shh. They gone. They just stepped outside the door. What are you mixed up in? I'm not mixed up in anything. Why are you so scared? You got shot, didn't you? I want to know why. I can tell you. But I'm not so sure about... Oh, why did I take that shortcut after all the times you asked me not to? Helen. I think I saw a guy murdered. <laughs> And I don't want to start throwing any weight around, Doctor, but if there's any possibility your patient in there may die, I need a statement and some information from him. I uh, don't know if I can permit that, Sergeant. His wife was allowed to see him this morning. Only for a little while, and only if she didn't allow him to get overexcited. I promise to take it easy. It's just... Well, Roy Richardson is still missing. Without him, we have no case against Augie Larch. Very well, then. But a few minutes. And I'm going to be in there to make sure you don't upset him. Be my guest. Why should I upset him if he's got nothing to hide? Uh, this is Detective Sergeant Marshall, Joe. He wants to ask you a few questions. I'll do, Sergeant. Feeling better? Well, kind of weak, like... Go ahead. Uh, you're a plumber, Mr. Wilson, huh? Yep. And last night you were called on an emergency job late after dinner. That's right. The Bensons, good customers, good friends of mine. Mm -hmm. They sprung a leak in the main water valve coming under the house. I had quite a time of it before I could get a new washer in there. And afterwards, you came home by the old high road? That's right. 
Saves about three miles over going around a new road. At what time was this, Mr. Wilson? Oh, 11, maybe quarter 12. And what time did you leave to go to the Benson's? Hmm? Around 7.30. Got there maybe about 8. Mm-hmm. Three hours to put in a washer? Well, like I say, I, I had a tough time of it. And the Bensons are old friends. I stuck around talking. Had a beer or so. And it was coming back on the old high road you were shot. That's right. How? Well, see, I was coming around a sharp bend where the road kind of dips down in a hollow. Uh-huh. And I hear what sounds like a blowout. So I hit the brakes, slow down as I come around the bend. And I see in my headlights this car parked off the road by the lake uh, facing me with the headlights off. The car was off the road? Well, half on the shoulder. Uh, and right beside it, there was two other guys lifting someone like he was hurt. I stopped and I got out and I yelled, could I help? And before I knew it, one of them pulled a gun and took a shot at me. And hit you. That's why I'm here. What did you do then? What would you do? I dived from my car and got out of the engine running and I took off right past them like a hound dog with a bee up his tail. They shoot at you again? Sergeant, I don't know. All I knew was I was hurt and heading for the hospital. Another thing to thank God for. They hadn't pulled off the road. I'd never got past them. Uh. Uh, you know, uh, Roy Richardson, Mr. Wilson? Name's familiar, but... Uh, you ever hear of Augie Larch? Oh, you mean the, the, the gangster, the mob guy? Now you tell me, was he one of the men you saw murder Roy Richardson? Oh, I don't know f for sure who was murdered or even if it was. Oh, you must have seen these men in your headlights. Could you identify any of them for us? Oh... I don't, I don't know if I... If I if You'd I, be willing to try, huh? Well, I, I, I guess... Sure, sure. I, I, I mean... All right, I, Sergeant. I, I'm sorry, but I'll have to stop you. That's quite enough for now. Oh. Okay. You're the doctor. But I'm going to have to talk to him again. Just so long as it won't endanger his life. Oh, oh, don't worry about that. His life is just as important to me as it is to you, doctor. But from here on in... I'm going to do everything I can to protect it. I haven't told the kids about about you yet, Joe. Because all day I, I've been doing a lot of thinking. What kind of thinking, Helen? You got yourself mixed up with some real bad, no-good trash. <laughs> Don't you think I know that, hon? They left me with a big enough message to remind me. Their message is from the other side, too. You know, there's a policeman on guard outside your door. Why? Joe, darling, those men are the one that, who shot you and the other one. Could you recognize them if you saw them again? <sighs> I'm still mixed up. Like sometimes I tell myself, I'm not 100% sure I could. And then I shut my eyes. And I know I could pick them out in that jam-packed ballpark. But if I really got to tell the truth, I think maybe the reason is I'm just plain scared. Oh, Joe, darling, don't you see that's just the way I feel? I don't want you to identify those men, even if you could. They've done enough to you already. I don't want you to take any chances they'll do any more. So, Helen, I got to do what's right. Why? You didn't ask to get tangled up in this, this, this filth and crime. You want all of us to creep around scared to death from here on in if you identify these men? Ronnie? Sue Carroll? Me? But, Look at what happened to you already. But, Helen, it's like I'm, I'm a citizen. Uh, if I've got rights, I, I got duties, too. Joe... Promise me you'll stay out of it. That's the only way all of us can be sure we'll be safe. Especially you. Your 
Oh, uh, sure, Sergeant Marshall. Positive identification, Doctor. He hadn't been in the water that long. After talking to Mr. Wilson, we located the spot where the shooting took place. We had a crew with us, and they brought up Richardson the third time down. Bullet through his head. So there goes your witness on the evasion of taxes trial. Uh, small potatoes. Now we can get him on a bigger rap. Murder? If your patient, Mr. Wilson, comes through. Can I see him now? I'm sorry to have to break in on your visit, Mrs. Wilson, but Sergeant Grant has to talk to your husband. More questions, and not so much this time. I had a copy of the transcript you made to me this morning typed up. I'd uh, like to get it signed. I'm not going to look at your pictures. Why not? For the same reason I won't sign this statement. I, I can't identify the men. You indicated you might. Well, I'm not sure anymore. He'd be in terrible danger if he could. Mrs. Wilson, every precaution is being taken for your husband's safety. You saw the police guard outside the door. What about my wife and children? I'm trying to cover your house, too. With killers like these, that's no protection. What else can I do? Uh, could I come up with an idea? And welcome. Well, it's the neat old adage which solves all problems. Dead men tell no tales. I don't understand. Well, look, suppose everyone thought your husband had died from the bullet in him. What would those gunsels have to worry about then? You release that story to the press, I'll substantiate it. A big little white lie, eh, Doctor? Would you be willing to look at the pictures then, Mr. Wilson? And make an identification, if you find one? Or two? Helen? Oh, Joe, I, I don't know what to say. If everyone is willing to put themselves out like that, how can we let them down? Morning, Joe. Well, how's it going today? Well, I ain't ready to take on Muhammad Ali, <laughs> but I'm getting there. Well, this may give you a lift. The morning paper, page one. Shooting victim succumbs. Joseph Wilson, age 37, died at Mercy Hospital last night as the result of a mysterious bullet wound inflicted while he was driving along the old high road. Wilson, a plumber by trade, leaves a wife, Helen, and two children, ages eight and three. Let me see that. <laughs> well, you have the right. Not many men get to see their own obituaries. Sure gives a man a funny feeling. I'll bet. The victim's widow... Said he will be buried in Clemden Cemetery. <laughs> that policeman sure did it up thoroughly, didn't he? Well, they could scarcely release a story that you died without being nice enough to bury you. At least now, the killers are off your trail. Hello, Augie. Johnny A. You seen the papers this morning? <laughs> Good news, nothing. Forget it. I'm telling you, the guy ain't dead. About a half hour ago, I seen his wife sneak into the hospital. And just to make sure, I took a chance and went by his room at the hospital just a minute ago. There's still a cop outside the door. You don't need fuzz to guard a dead man. appears that our innocent bystander is still in jeopardy. Has a brilliantly performed operation saved his life, only to have it threatened once again? I'll return shortly with the answer to that and Act Three. Inside you're free, inside you're free after all, you hear freedom spirit. Like a wild bird call Inside you're free Inside you're free After all Living free Living free You feel like breaking loose And so off you go in a Skyhawk Buick's sleek, low-slung 2 plus 2 road machine Its streamlined nose thrust rakishly ahead Its spirited V6 engine Supplying the motion All of a sudden, living free becomes second nature Skyhawk Catch one at your Buick dealer now. Inside you're free. Inside you're free after all. Living free. Living free. Living free. Hi, 
Mal Belair's here with an interesting fact about water, brought to you by your local Culligan man. Did you know that in the United States, there's almost 20 times as much water in the ground as there is water on the surface? For example, Florida alone has more underground water than all the water in the Great Lakes combined. And uh, speaking of the Great Lakes, there's a popular misconception that Lake Michigan water is soft. However, according to a government study, to be classified as soft water must contain less than three and a half grains of hardness per gallon. And Lake Michigan water contains about eight grains of hardness per gallon. So, call your local Culligan man. Ask him to show you the difference that hardness makes. Whether you have Lake Michigan water or other than Lake Michigan water, you'll be astounded. There's no cost or obligation, so call your Culligan man today. You'll find him underwater in the yellow pages. This is WBBM Chicago, News Radio 78. The time is 11.06. It's 10 above at Midway. It was Robert Burns, the Scottish poet, who penned the lines, The best laid schemes of mice and men gang off to glay. Certainly all the plans to protect Joe Wilson by announcing his apparent death have been negated by his wife's thoughtless and untimely visit and the fifth columnist in the hospital. Unfortunately, the doctors and the police are unaware of this. Still, what can men even as desperate as Augie Larch do to stop Joe from identifying them now? It ain't good enough, Johnny. But Augie, what else can I do? I don't know. What a fool I was to be with you when we rubbed out Richardson. The way it was, we didn't have time to handle it any other way. All I know is this isn't just beating a little income tax evasion. My neck is on the line for the big M. So's mine, Augie. Yeah, well, that's what I'm counting on. I'm sending you Gus. Between you, you better figure out some way to make that orbit come true. Okay, boss. But don't you give Gus a gun. I'll handle that end if we need it. Don't worry, it's muscle I'm sending you. I wouldn't trust him with a gun either. But don't forget, I don't care how you do it, but I want that witness dead. Like I said, it's my neck on the line too, Augie. One way or another, that's just what he'll be before the day's out. And Mrs. Wilson is up with him now still? I... I guess so. I, I've been on rounds. After all our arrangements, why did you let her go up there? She was already in the hospital and on his floor before I bumped into her by accident. I tried to argue her out of the doctor, but she insisted on seeing him. Yes, and if those mobsters are having the hospital watch, the whole cover scheme may be out the window by now. Well, even if he was dead, she had a right to come and make arrangements for his funeral. Yes, I suppose. But when Sergeant Marshall turns up, he'll probably blow a gasket. Not the damage of any is done already, so there's no use our getting excited about it. One thing we can do. What? Smuggle her out of here the best way possible without a chance of her being seen. I have fourth floor nurse's desk. Well, this is Dr. Peterson. He is. Oh, yeah, well, um, would you tell him I'll be right down? That's the sergeant. He's downstairs. Now, look, Toby, I'll go down and delay him a little. We can't wait for dark. You go along to the room and get Mrs. Wilson out of there. All right. I don't care how you do it, but if possible, without being recognized. Honey, I don't care how much, how long you argue with me. You're not going to change my mind. Joe, why should you risk your life? Helen, I know you love me. But you should have gone on out to Dayton with the kids like we planned. Oh. You took an awful chance coming here today when I'm supposed to... Be... I, I, I know, I know. But I told you, I sent the kids off last night and your mom and pa were going to meet them. I couldn't go, Joe. I laid awake all night worrying about the chance you're taking. And I had to come to ask you not to take it. Baby, I'm a citizen. It's my duty. I'm sorry to break in on you, but... 
Sergeant Marshall is downstairs and on the way up. Mrs. Wilson, I think you'd better get out of here. Helen, you listen to the doctor and me. You go. You let me do what I have to. Joe. If I'm going to live, I have to live with myself. And there's only one way I guess I can do that. I'm not going to try to pretend I'm not sorry the wife came here, but there's no sense in worrying over spilt milk, Dr. Peterson. The sooner we get a positive identification on who murdered Roy Richardson, the sooner Joe Wilson will be out of danger. From outside threats, perhaps. Hmm? The man is still fighting for his life from the damage that bullet did to him inside. So, uh, take it as easy on him as you can. Cops are human, Doc. Yeah, that's all right, officer. Just relax, but keep your wits about you. Hmm? Uh, can we go in, doctor? Oh, sure. Well, afternoon, Mr. Wilson. This shouldn't hurt too much. I've uh, brought some pictures, so it wouldn't be too heavy. I had the computer select them so you didn't have to wade through the whole mug file. Uh, for example, uh, this here first one. Uh, do you recognize him as one of the men you saw carrying Roy Richardson's body the night of the murder? Well, why, that's... Uh, I've seen his picture in the newspapers. Uh, he's a prominent man. Uh, was he one of them? i like to get something straight first. Ask. If I identify the guys, uh -huh. what happens then? Well, we pick them up and arrest them. And I'm out of it? Well, not exactly. Why not? Because your statement would not be admissible in court unless you're there to be questioned not only by the state, but counsel for the defense. Due process of law. I see. Why do you ask? It's all right, I'll get that. Because uh, I'm afraid yes, my wife will feel I sold her and the children down the river. It's... The other way, you're right. buying her, your children, and yourself freedom from fear. I'm sorry there's some flowers for Joe's special receipt requested. Flowers for a dead man, huh? There's a card. Here. You read it, Sergeant. Joseph C. Wilson, room 412. Best wishes, Joe, from your watchful friends, both here and in Dayton. That's right. Dayton. Where I sent my kids to be safe. I'll oh, forget about this. Your wife shouldn't have come to see you this morning, but you'll be protected. Yeah, we're going to be protected, Sergeant Marshall. You get your little pen and pencil out. I'm going to give you my final statement. Now, wait a minute. Not even a second. You start writing. It was too dark on the old high road for me to see a thing. I don't know what happened. I couldn't identify anyone in a million years. Just count me out as a witness. Oh, Toby, you look bushed. <sighs> Tired enough to step out of channels and say to the chief of staff... So do you. Well, it's an occupational hazard. Can't you take a break? No, sir. I have emergency clinic from 8 to 12. How about you? Oh, 24 hours a day for me. Hmm. Cheer up. The further you go, the worse it gets. Well, happy clinic. Oh, it shouldn't be too bad. It's a Tuesday. Tuesdays always seem to be slow for some reason. Well, then let's hope it runs true to form. <laughs> Hey, Gus. Uh, Let's try to forget your belly and concentrate on what you need clinic service for, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I got a bum ankle. Yeah. Concentrate on your ankle. Yeah. It's sprained. Uh, it hurts like hell. Maybe it's even broken. Okay? Yeah. Now it's dark enough. Let's go. Next. Ah, uh, hi, Doc. Not so busy tonight, huh? Which makes doctors thankful for small mercies. Oh, I guess you are right. <laughs> What's the matter with your friend? Well, well, we was visiting a friend here in the hospital. Yeah, yeah, and on the way out, I, I turned my ankle on a step coming down from the front door. Oh, the pain! On a step down, leaving the hospital? Yeah. Well, let's have a look. Which ankle? Uh, 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 the right, yeah, doctor. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't see any evidence of... Well, any... uh, now we're all alone. Uh, can you see this, doctor? Uh, a gun? That's right. Well, you must be paranoid. 
One shot in this whole hospital. You wouldn't hear a thing. No silence, sissy. Close the door, Gus. Right. What is it you want? Get us in to see Joe Wilson. And get us out with him. You ought to be able to figure a way. But real quick. Do you really think you can parade me through the hospital at the point of a gun? Even a silenced one? No parade, Doc. Nobody's going to pay us any attention. You're already dressed the part. Gus on a rolling cart like uh, this here. You get me a set of whites like an orderly. We're taking poor Gus and his badly sprained ankle to the x-ray or wherever. Now let's stop stalling and get moving. Okay, Gus, you just lie down. Yeah. <clears throat> now, Doc, you on the front end of the cart and me pushing on the back. Only stay on the side, real close. Feel the gun. What are you going to do with Mr. Wilson when you get there? Get rid of him. But I promise you, he hasn't identified anyone to the police. He ain't gonna have the chance. And what about me? You're not so hot at guessing, are you, Doc? Hi, Toby. I mean, Dr. Grant. What you got there? A uh, badly sprained ankle, Doctor. Uh, Maybe a break. Uh, going to x-ray. Why don't you let the orderly take him? Let's just have a cup of coffee. Uh, I, uh, I'm afraid I can't, Doctor. This is a little more serious than that. It looks like he has uh, a lecturus pylorum. And I'm afraid the constrictor pharyngus may be involved. The constrictor for... You know how dangerous that can be, Doctor. There may even be a break involved. I want to stop that if it's possible. Okay, Doctor, that's your problem. You'll be able to handle it. I'll just go hit the hay for the night. You do that, Doctor. I've got to get this man up to fourth floor x-ray for special pictures. Oh, by the way, you better take the back elevator. The front one's out of whack again. Oh, I, I didn't know. Oh, didn't the orderly tell you? Well, he's a new man, Doctor. We'll, we'll handle it. Okay, it's your problem. I'm going home and forget the hospital exists. Nice going, Miss Doc. You handle that real sensible. Now, how far to the other elevator? Oh, not far. Just a few zigs and zags. It's in the old building. But what do you expect to do when you get there? Just substitute our stretcher passenger for Joe Wilson. Gus has an orderly suit he can change to. Then we just wheel our patient back down and out of your life. Out of mine? It's like any professional job. You can't leave any loose ends. This the elevator? Yes. I, I guess this is it. Now look. This is the last lap. So far, everything has gone pretty smooth. Well, let's keep it that way. Okay, Gus, you all dressed? Yeah, these white things feel nice. Fine, fine, fine. Just let's concentrate on trundling this cart past that cop with the doctor's help and pick up our boy. Now, when we get to the cop... You already got to him, Johnny Angel. That's a police positive in your back. Just don't move. Or you, Gus. I got three guys covering you. Step aside, Dr. Grant. Don't Let's try it! it. Oh. oh, damn. You shot me. I warned you. Okay. Oh, I guess you got me all the way. But Augie and I can't get off scot free. Don't worry. Joe Wilson will be able to identify him now. Oh, oh come. You, you nailed me. Oh, you shouldn't fool around with doctors, Johnny, eh? Male or female. Oh, you're just not smart enough. What, what do you what do you mean? Well, you tell him, Doctor. Well, Gus was supposed to have a sprained ankle. When Dr. Peterson asked me what was the matter with him, remember what I told him? <laughs> Some double talk. I said he had an erectoris pylorum. Yeah, what's that mean? It's a very small muscle at the base of the hair follicles. You, you gave me the old d double O. <laughs> yeah, not the ankle. A muscle at the base of each hair in your head. It's enough to make your hair stand on end, isn't it, Johnny Angel? <laughs> 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 
With the help of Joe Wilson's identification, Augie Larch and Johnny Angel were charged with criminal homicide and held without bail. Later, both were convicted and sentenced to maximum terms. Joe recovered successfully, and he and Helen subsequently had two more children. It's really another story with a happy ending, uh, more or less, uh, except for one thing. In the state where our story took place, murder in the first degree is, once again, the death penalty. I'll be back shortly. Some people think we play ping pong all day. They're wrong. The USO isn't all fun and games. Today, the USO has millions of problems like this one in Germany. My family's going crazy living in a tiny apartment. Where can we live? Today's USO has millions of problems like this one in Asia. I'm hooked on drugs. Where can I get help? Or this problem in Athens. Our marriage is breaking up. Can you help us? Today's USO has little time for ping pong. We've got serious work to do. We've got lots of new problems here and overseas. The problems are big. How big? Well, if someone asks you, who needs the USO? Tell them, we do, we do. Over 5 million American military personnel and their families need today's USO. And because we get no government funds, we need all your support. Please give to USO through the United Way or local USO campaign. The one thing that remained strongest in Joe Wilson's mind after the horror and pain of his experience had faded was the decision he had come to, finally, to make the identification. For whatever satisfaction the criminal's attempt to stop him may have given them on the way to the grave, for the rest of his life, Joe had a far better one. He could face himself every morning in the mirror and be sure, more than most of us, that he was a man. And a good one. Our cast included Joan Shea, Ken Harvey, Sam Gray, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. How did this happen? I mean, to your leg. Well, he, he was chopping wood. His foot slipped and the axe caught him right at the ankle. Uh, it didn't seem like such a deep cut. He's had worse. So we, well, we bound it up and he went about his business for a couple of days and... And then the swelling started. And then the fever set in. Oh, feel his forehead. He's burning up. Where's the axe? The, the axe? The axe. The thing that caused the whole mess. Where is it? Well, right there by the door. Oh, what are you going to do, Mr. Mather? You won't cut my leg off, will you? Oh, of course I'm not going to cut off your leg. I'm going to punish this axe. I'm going to make it suffer. I'm going to torture it. I'm going to make it endure such pain. But but how? How are you going to do that, Mr. Mather? I'm going to crucify it. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... Hey, weirdos. Our next Weirdo Watch Party is this Saturday, August 17th, with weirdo family favorite Mistress Malicious and her crew from Mistress Peace Theater. This time, Mistress is bringing us a film from 2015 entitled Killer Piñata. A possessed piñata seeking to avenge the savagery that humanity has inflicted on his kind picks off a group of friends one by one in an unending night of terror. I'm going to take a wild guess and say this is more comedy and less creeps, but we'll find out. The fun begins this Saturday night, August 17th at 7 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Mountain, 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch. Just tune in at showtime and watch the movie with me and other Weirdo family members. 
and even join in the chat during the film for more fun. It's Mistress Malicious presenting Killer Piñata this Saturday night, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. You can see a trailer for the film now and watch horror hosts and B-movies for free anytime on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash TV. See you Saturday! London, too. Great places for a honeymoon. We can go any place we like, Brad. You're cute, Mary. Dear, I'd be happy if we stayed right here. Life isn't all coasting downhill. Yeah, you're sure right. I'm going to take this business of being married real serious. Darling, you'd better slow down. Yeah. Hey, hey the, the brakes, Mary. They won't work. <gasps> Goodyear presents The Sounds of Darkness. The Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, makers of passenger, truck, and tractor tires for every requirement in South Africa's farming, commerce, and industry, bring you Lee Masters, the blind detective who challenges the sounds of darkness. Tonight's Sounds of Darkness, you will hear Tony Jay as Lee Masters and James White as Johnny Bridges. Others in the cast are Melody O'Brien, John Hater, Kerry Jordan, and Hugh Rouse. Now let's join the world of Lee Masters in tonight's Sounds of Darkness, Pressure Point. Come in, Lee. Uh, this is Miss Bowers, Miss Mary Bowers. How do you do, Miss Bowers? My assistant, Johnny Bridges. Uh, Lee Masters, FBI agent. Uh, how do you do, Mr. Masters? Sit down, sit down. Uh, here, Lee. Oh, thanks. He's blind. Oh, yes, Miss Bowers. Lee Masters is blind. But... Miss Bowers, uh, we're often distracted by all we see. Lee isn't... Uh... His powers of concentration, deduction, and heightened senses, other than sight, are quite extraordinary. And I think in your case, we might be able to make particular use of them. Uh, that's why I especially asked headquarters to send Mr. Masters here to help out. I really don't see why, Mr. Bald. I mean, all I want is for somebody to talk to Brand and protect him for a while. Well, well, whether you like it or not, Miss Bowers, you are an important person. Mary Bowers. Only daughter of Len Bowers died in 46, leaving a fortune estimated at 26 million, made from marketing the package rather than the goods. Mrs. Bowers predeceased him by two years, and the entire fortune was left in trust to the daughter, Mary Bowers. And the income to be enjoyed by her so long as she remains single. On marriage... A quarter of the fortune goes to her, 
the remainder will to the Bowers Foundation. The Denver News, February 24, 1946. That's right. But, Mr. Masters, how? It's amazing. Miss Bowers is thinking of getting married, Lee. Uh-huh. Oh, but there's nothing like that about Brand. Uh, Mr. Galway, I mean. Not what you're thinking. He'd be the last man to go fortune hunting. And as you know, he's the one these dreadful accidents have been happening to. Accidents, Miss Bowers? Oh, yeah. Uh, Brakes of his car tampered with nearly fatally. An elevator door prized open. He nearly fell. An electric switch shorted, so he nearly electrocuted himself. Oh, and some more. Mm. So you've got to protect him from the murderer. Or the murdered, Miss Bowers. <laughs> I told Mary, I I told her I didn't want to fuss, mate. Not even when somebody tried to kill you? They didn't succeed. Let's forget the whole thing, Mr. Masters. Mr. Galway, your fiancé might have been killed. Do you want to forget that? I want to be left alone. For somebody to have a crack at you again, Mr. Galway? You like attempts being made on your life? No, of course not. There won't be another attempt. Good day, gentlemen. No, Mr. Galway, I don't think the next one will be an attempt. I think it might very well be successful. Somebody's after this guy, you reckon? Somebody wanting to marry that fortune themselves? I don't think they need worry. Mr. Galway is married already. What? It gets me. How do you know Galway's married? I can tell because I can't look at them. Faces change, but voices don't. His real name's Galowski, and he was up on a confidence trick charge years ago. I remember he made quite an impassioned appeal. To you all, to try and understand why I did it. It wasn't for profit or gain, it was purely a friendly gesture. The fact is, I stood to lose more than the man who now accuses me. I don't plead for my wife who even now is in hospital. Having a baby, as a matter of fact. Yeah? And what did he have? Six months to think about it. Come on, Johnny. Brand is going to get some phone calls. Let's get the phone tapped and record all his calls. I got this first call just half an hour ago, Lee. Play it. Got back and phoned you at once. I don't understand. Why on earth should the FBI be interested? I don't know. Well, it doesn't matter, darling. You know what? No, Mary, what? I think we should get married at once. I think that's a great idea, just great. Mm -hmm. I always say great minds think alike. Funny enough, if if you hadn't suggested... Did they get anything else? Yeah, there was a call right right after this one. Let's hear it. This time, there won't be a next time for you. You said there wasn't going to be. That's Galway, all right, but I don't know who the other guy is. Here, Robert, if you try anything like that again, I'll... So help me, I'll go to the police. And tell them the beautiful story who I am. Don't make me laugh. How's... Dear Miss Bowers, you'll leave her alone. You young idiot. You might have killed her. Too bad. And I will next time. Now listen, Robert. You do anything to her and I'll kill you with my own hands. Don't worry. When it happens to her, it'll happen to you at the same time. Nice, eh? Hello? I've got nothing more to say to you. That's it. Play it back. That bit right at the end. He said, uh, nice, eh? And then there was a pause. Yeah, sure. With my own hands. Don't worry. When it happens to her, it'll happen to you at the same time. Nice, eh? Well, that's it. Quiet. Hello? Okay, I've got nothing more to say to you. You uh, listen to silences, Lee? 
Silences talk loudest. Pass me the directory. He didn't get the caller's number that time. It came right after the first call on the engineer. Hey, you looking for something? The business listed part. The user lighter paper. Ah. All right, Johnny. Clocks and watchmakers. Sure. Accountants, bricklayers, banks, quarters. Yeah, here we are. Read them out. Adams, Burnside, Devells. The first names. Uh, Reg Adams, Burnside and Fisher, David Devells, Bruce Hallam, Rob Jackson. That one. Rob Jackson? Rob Robert? Address. 2230 Southside. In that pause between him saying nice A and uh, hello on the tape, I can hear clocks ticking. More than I can. Well, when we get there, you'll be able to see them. And he called the man on the phone, Robert. Gee, we make a great team. Twenty-two twenty-eight. Twenty-two thirty. Watchmaker. Yeah, watches, clocks, rings, usual sort of place. All right, let's go in and see if Robert's the usual sort of man. Sure, the door's this way. Yeah, this is the place. And the counter's over this way. There must be Robert behind it. Young chap. Pale, look seedy. Yeah? Is there anything I can show you? Hmm. It's a remarkably fine piece of craftsmanship. Oh, you mean this porcelain, a figure of a shepherdess? Uh, it's not so good. Well, you can have it for $20. You might be giving away a fortune, Mr. Jackson. You see the eyes? Made in Germany. Job lost. Look closely. I don't see anything. Hmm. Perhaps you're right. For a moment, I thought it was Dresden. Well, it's made there. Martin. Keeping a store, watching clock mending, requires a delicate touch, Mr. Jackson. Your hands are more like those of a mechanic's. I've got a right to a hobby. Look, if I like mucking about with things, it's none of your business, is it? We're from the FBI. And everything becomes the business of the FBI sooner or later. Because sooner or later... Everything has some bearing on criminal activities. Are, are you accusing me of something? No, Mr. Jackson. Finding out about you. Now, look, I've had enough. Now, go on. Get out. I know my rights. Sure, sure. Your rights are within the scope of the law. But when you step out of the law, you're walking into barred places. Hey, that's good. Barred places, see, it means... I'm sure Mr. Jackson knows what I mean, Johnny. Shall we go? <laughs> yeah, uh, this way. You know, I'd like to be a clockmaker. Everything precise, everything fitting. Wheels going round in perfect synchronization. I gotta hand it to you, Lee. Neat. Very neat. Talk of the China Shepherdess and his hands get close enough for you to smell the oil and grease. I smelled more than that. Oh, yeah, the nicotine stains on his fingers. So, what do we know? He smokes too much. He's nervous. And those hands do car repairs more than watches. Mm, not bad. But I learned far more than that. You did? Yeah. The stains on his fingers weren't nicotine. They weren't? No. Picric acid. Huh? It's a strong dye. Unmistakable smell. A dye? And it's used for other things as well. Yeah? Such as? Explosives, Johnny. Explosives. I don't get it. Why? All right, we find Robert Jackson, but why do we have to find a private investigator? Uh, if you were going to arrange an accident, wouldn't you have to find out his movements first? Yeah, sure, but... Oh, I get it. Mm -hmm. I see. Hey, so you think the Jackson's going to blow up Galway? <laughs> Tick-tock. A time bomb? Uh, looks like it, doesn't it? 
He's got the time bomb. All we've got is the time before the bomb goes off. Oh, go away. Right. Yeah, yeah. We'll put two men onto it. It's a big case. A big case. Matter of fact, we've been called in to help the FBI out. Yeah, who are you? FBI. Uh, oh, you understand, it's a gag. Just a gag to impress the customers. There wasn't anybody on the other end. Oh, I'm Lee Masters. This is Johnny Bridges. Hi. Lee Masters? The blind... A famous Lee Masters? We all have our afflictions, Mr. Shane. Yeah, mine's at home. Well, what can I do for you? Is uh, Mr. Brand Galway on your books? Galway? Well, he's not on our books. I, I mean, he's not a client. The subject of investigation? Yeah. And the client is Mr. Robert Jackson, 2230 Southside. That's right. Just a routine check. He wants to know what Mr. Galway's doing and so on. And what is Mr. Galway doing lately? Well, he's taken off two ways. First, he's taken off into matrimonial fields. Then he's taken off literally for the honeymoon. Uh, just a moment. Uh, yeah, he's booked himself and wife on Transcon Flight 208 to Los Angeles and on to Hawaii on a Pacific flight. When? Tomorrow. Have you told your client, Robert Jackson? About half an hour ago. Do you want I should contact him? No. We'll do that. Now. You are listening to Pressure Point. Tonight's Sounds of Darkness brought to you by Goodyear, the greatest name in rubber. there? Having trouble? Oh, wasn't it always the way you're in a hurry, call for a package, nobody's there, all here. All right, all right, I'm trying. Oh. I guess he's working on something out back. Huh? Oh, sorry to keep you, Mr. Buckland, a, a bit of repair work I could... Yeah, but... Oh. Oh, it's, it's you. In person. Now, look, mister, I was here first. I, I don't know what business you have with this man, but I'm here to pick up a package. Go I, ahead, I... Mr. Buckland. Oh, Oh, thanks. Uh, that package, Mr. Jackson, the one I ordered earlier, had paid for it, too. Here's the check. Oh, uh, yeah, Mr. Buckland. Uh, here we are. Oh, thanks. Yeah, well, I'll see you. I'm sorry to rush. Uh, flying to Fiji first thing in the morning. Bye. Well? You're in touch with a private agent, Mr. Jackson. He's checking on the movements of Mr. Galway and passing the information on to you. So? That's a federal offense, is it? Mr. Galway's real name is Golovsky. And that's your name, too, isn't it? Well, so what? You can use a name without being arrested for it. And being Mr. Galway's son doesn't get you arrested either. His son? How did you... <laughs> well, of course it was obvious, but I didn't know you were onto it too, Lee. Your mother died five years ago. She died in a car accident. Your father was driving, and although no charge was brought against him, you believed he'd done it deliberately. And you decided to take the law into your own hands. You can say it, but uh, can you prove it? You're using picric acid. Out in the back there, you're making explosives. You're a clockmaker. All right. So, what do you want to do about it? Take you in for questioning. Suspicion's good enough, Lee. We could hold him for a few days. Yeah, but uh, not long enough. How's that? We got him. We got. What you don't get is that he's already planted his bomb. It's the tone of his voice. You're watching his face. The boys in there are watching his face. I'm listening. He's sure of himself. Not that he'll be arrested, but that he doesn't care. But to blow up his old man, I talk of the dead. I will not have interference. My son is harmless. 
You can say he's psychotic if you like, but all his pranks in the past have been just that, pranks. Pranks, Mr. Galway? Pranks? Ah, miss. And you needn't think telling Mary about my past will make any difference. We love each other. Sure, I didn't tell her about my wife's death. You did. But that hasn't made any difference at all. She phoned. I explained she's happy. Mr. Galway, your son's a clockmaker. He knows about explosives. You're going on your honeymoon by plane. What does that suggest to you? You told me yourself you've taken him in. All right, he's in. We're off on our honeymoon. If he does get at you in a plane, that means your wife is with you and both of you get killed. Not to mention the rest of the passengers. You're the FBI, Mr. Masters. It's up to you to see that the plane is safe. Uh, We'll do our best. Well, we'll be seeing you, Mr. Galway. I doubt it. But we're going to be on that plane. So will we, Mr. Galway. So will we. Oh, no. talking, boasting, quote, they can't do anything about it now, unquote, ends. Oh, no. That means he's planted it. Yeah. I'll have a word with Mr. and Mrs. Galway. Uh, I just received a message from headquarters. Your son, Mr. Galway, boasts to, quote, they can't do anything about it now. You realize what that means. You took him in. How come he's got away with it? Because he's clever. Even if he hasn't got away with it, he's going to put us through hell until we land. What is it? What is it, Brad? Uh, Nothing, dear. Just something that's come up. You're so clever, you do something about it. I tried to, but you didn't cooperate. What's that got to do with it? You're the FBI. It's your job. What's your job, Brad? That fool son of mine really has planted a bomb. You're not going to do anything about it. You're going to sit there and let it be blown up, Mr. Masters? Please, Mrs. Galway. Things are bad enough without having a panic on board. There are other passengers, you know. I knew you were a fool. Now I know you're a blind fool. Easy, darling. Well, why doesn't he do his job? Mr. Galway, he might have somehow got you to bring it aboard. Did he give you anything? Do you do you carry anything he could have planted it in? No, I don't think so. Wallet and luggage, that sort of thing. I haven't got any hand luggage. Mrs. Galway. Don't ask me. Through your bungling, we're all liable to be killed. Johnny. What is it, Lee? I may be able to hear. The jet noise might not drown out something ticking. You go along to the flight deck. Tell the captain who you are and what's happened. Tell him to stand by. Right. Don't rush. Stroll. Okay. I wander down the aisle on my way to the washroom. Oh, good luck. Very good luck. And good listening. What's happening now? Look at him. Wandering away as if nothing matters. Well, he's blind. Blind people can hear better. Tenth row my life, and believe me, travel's not for me. Pardon me. Uh, huh? You're Mr. Buckland? I don't know you, sir. No, uh, we met in the clockmakers. Oh, did we? Well, I don't remember. When I travel, sir, I prefer silence rather than idle chatter with strangers. Silence, sir. It's golden. Silence. Silence. Of course. The one thing that will set it off that's silent. I don't get you, sir. A package. He gave you a package, the the clockmaker. Sure, a retirement presentation. I I took it in to get the engraving altered. Have you got it with you? Hmm? I don't see, sir, what that's got to do with you. Have you got it with you? Officially, the captain says... That package this man collected from Jackson's when we were there. Is it here? Sure, it's it's on the floor. Here, I I, I don't know what you think you're doing, but I was... FBI. I got it. Get the wrappings off. Unmistakable. J. 
Shell Lake night. Where would it be? In the base? Yeah, it unscrews. A barometer. Aneroid. The higher the plane goes, the lower the pressure. The needle moves. Yeah, there's a wire across, but just wait a minute, Lee. The plane is pressurized. Not the luggage hole, Johnny. And that was the chance our friend Robert the clockmaker was hoping for. A bulky, awkward package like this will normally go in the luggage compartment. But Robert wasn't to know that we were going to search the plane and luggage. So with the delay, there was no time for Mr. Buckland here to send his package luggage freight. Instead, he took it as hand luggage. And thank heaven for that. L.A. Dear old L.A. and ground under our feet. Well, everybody's got to come down to earth sometime. I guess I owe you an apology, Mr. Masters. Sure, I knew my boy was after me, but... Well, uh, I guess like all fathers, you think uh, he's a good boy, really. It's over now. But not for him. I didn't kill my first wife, you know. It was an accident, pure and simple. But Robert didn't think so. No. As a matter of fact, after the time I got engaged to marry here, he didn't really mean me harm. Not harm. But, uh... Afterwards, I guess, well, he thought I was responsible for her death. It was just too much for him when I'd marry again. What'll happen? Uh, to him, I mean. Uh, it'll be more treatment than penitence. But I think it'll be a long, long time before he can play any more <laughs> pranks. Tonight's Sounds of Darkness, presented for your entertainment by the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, makers of world-famous passenger tires, truck, and tractor tires for every requirement in South Africa's farming, commerce, and industry. Join us next Friday and every Friday night at 9.30 when Goodyear will again present the blind detective Lee Masters in... The Sounds of Darkness. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you. So much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past. Absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. The 
The story you are about to hear is true, but strange. On Christmas Eve, Tom, you picked up a girl on the road and didn't even tell me about it. Oh, wait a minute, Lucille. How do you... She was a beautiful girl with eyes like nothing a man has ever seen before. You've been talking to Bill? And you end up at my house walking around as though you weren't quite connected with this world. Answer me. Have you been talking to Bill? Did he tell you about this? I've talked with Bill, but he didn't tell me any part of this. Neither did anyone else. But I know, and I can tell you every detail of that ride. How? That's why you're out for this ride, darling. I'm going to show you how. Strange, true stories of the supernatural... With your narrator, famous author, lecturer, and expert on weird and unusual events, Walter Gibson. Thank you, Charles Woods. At the turn of the century, a train ran through Connecticut, which local residents dubbed the Ghost Train. It was real enough at the time, but its white cars gave it a weird effect when seen through the night. In years to come, the term became even more appropriate. A few years ago, Tom Lacey was driving over back roads in Connecticut to spend Christmas with his fiancée. In the rear seat, his friend Bill Bowen was dozing comfortably along with his dog Spangles. Tom didn't like the road very much. Ah, we should have put on chains. It's pretty hard to hold this car down on these old high-crowned roads. Hey, that sounds like a sleigh. Where is it? Gee, I wonder if there could be a side road running along here. Gosh, I can hear those bells as plain as day, but there's not a sign of the sleigh, either in front of us or behind us. Well, I'd sure hate having to stop for it in a hurry while I'm going down this long hill. The train coming. It's an old steam train. Gee, I thought everything up here was diesel. More bells. The sleigh must have stopped for the train, and I'd better. Whoa, whoa. White cars. It's like a ghost train. This is funny. The seal didn't mention anything about railroad crossing in her direction. There's somebody in the road, I think. Yeah, it's a girl. She's going looking for a ride way out here. Well, there's somebody to talk to since Bill won't wake up. Hey, get in. You you must be frozen standing out there. Here. Here, I'll close the door for you. Well, where to, miss? To my house. In the valley at the foot of the long hill road. My father is ill. I must get to him right away. Right away. Long Hill Road, I, I'm afraid I, I don't know where that is. Take the first right down the hill. At the bottom, take the left fork across the covered bridge. It's the first house, the other side of the river. Okay, take it easy, I'll get you there. This is the place, miss. Yes. Uh, there's somebody waiting for you on the porch, I think, with a lantern. My brother, Leonard. Oh. Oh, wait a minute. Let me get the door. It sticks. Thank you. Well, wait a minute. Uh, you don't have to be in such a hurry, do you? I'd kind of like to see you again. After Christmas, I'm sure my father will be well. Good night.
It was a gay Christmas at the home of Lucille Rutledge, Tom's fiancée. But Tom, oddly enough, was more quiet than usual. Although Lucille worried a little, asking if he felt all right, Tom would not admit to anything being wrong. Finally, she got Bill Boland aside to ask a few pertinent questions. Bill, will you talk to me for a minute? Sure, pick a subject. I can't help wondering what's happened to Tom. Do you have any idea? Well, I didn't know anything had happened to him. Oh, well, now, he's not being himself at all. He's quiet. <laughs> and you know that's not at all like Tom. Uh, come to think of it, I guess that's right. We haven't seen each other since Thanksgiving. Are, are you sure that... He hasn't met another girl. No, no, no. Look, he dragged me through every high-priced store on Fifth Avenue before we came up here, and he was like an anxious adolescent. Did I think you'd like this? Did I think you'd oh, like that? No. Was it the right color? <laughs> Does that sound like a guy who's got his mind on another girl? No. And one of you certainly had good taste in presents, I must say. <laughs> but just the same, he's been quiet and strained ever since he got here. So something must have happened. Tom. Bill, nothing happened along the road, did it? Well, you can't prove it by me. I was asleep most of the way out here. No, think hard. Well, honest, nothing. I, Well, I vaguely remember hearing Tom muttering to himself while he drove along, but I... Uh, and? Well, you know, now that I think of it, I do seem to remember a woman's voice in there a couple of times. Of course, I thought I was dreaming. Do you remember where you heard it? Oh, I didn't even open my eyes. All I know is we were going down a hill... We seem to have been going down a hill the whole way up here. Ah, uh, it was a long hill, in other words. Now I know what's been the matter with Tom. Oh, wait a minute, Lucille. If there's anything I've said, I don't want to get it. Uh, rest easy, Bill. But tomorrow I'm going to take Tom out for a drive, and you're not invited. Although the roads hadn't improved a bit... Lucille insisted on going out for a drive with Tom on the following day. She took the wheel, and as the car pulled out of the village, she said... I should be jealous, you know. Huh? Yes, you pick up a girl along the road, don't even tell me about it. Wait a minute, now, She's a beautiful girl, with eyes like nothing a man has ever seen before. You've been talking to Bill. And you end up at my house, walking around as though you weren't, well, quite connected with this world. Answer me. Have you been talking with Bill? I've talked with Bill, yes, but he, he didn't tell me any of this. Well, then how'd you know? Aha. Uh -huh. Ah, that's an admission that it's all true. Well, well, all right, I picked up the girl, yeah. I, well, she was standing beside the road trying to flag a ride to her home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well... It looked pretty cold out there, so I took her home. Yeah, but you wanted to see her again. Well, I wanted... Well, well, I... <laughs> Look here. Was this kid a friend of yours? Or what? No. Well, then how did you know all this? I'm psychic. Oh, nonsense. No, really, Tom. Why the stare ever since you got here? Do you realize that you haven't looked me in the eyes once? Well, I... Why, I didn't realize them. I'm sorry, it won't happen again. Yes, but what's your promise worth? How do I know it won't happen again? Because I love you, and I want to marry you. And you're the only girl in the world for me. Oh. Well, that goes a long way toward getting you out of the doghouse. Oh, that's good. Now, if you can explain, walking around with a dreamy countenance... Well, you put your finger on it, all right. See that girl's eyes... They're what had me walking around in a trance. I, I just couldn't get them out of my mind. <laughs> all right, darling. Now, I'll show you how I happen to know all about it. Although, this is an advantage that I really should keep. By a roundabout way, Lucille drove Tom to the long hill where unexplained things had started happening to him. Different as it appeared in daylight, Tom could still recognize it, and he said so. 
That's right, darling. See, now we're headed back toward my house on exactly the same road you took Christmas Eve. Yeah. Do you remember hearing something around this point? Yeah, sleigh bells. Did you see the sleigh? No, that's what stuck me. You didn't see the sleigh because it was traveling an old road that doesn't exist anymore. It used to run parallel to this one, at least partway down the hill. And then, just about here, I should think, you started hearing a train whistle. Yeah, I'm darned if I did. How did you know? And when you came around this curve, you saw... I saw a train. Yes. But now... Look, in the light of day, do you see any railroad crossing there? No. There's not a sign of one. What was I, out of my head? Or... No, darling, you were all right. Look, look on either side of the road. You'll see the old railroad bed where the line used to run through here. Yeah. And right here is where you picked up the girl, isn't it? Yeah, she was standing right over there by that rock. Now, Tom, the reason I know exactly what happened is that it's happened before to other people down through the years. You see, back around 1900, a girl named Ethel Wyman was hurrying down this hill in a sleigh trying to reach her father's sickbed before he died. And she was struck and killed here by the train that used to run on this line. Yeah, and it was painted all white, wasn't yes. it? And every year at Christmas time, the scene is reenacted with the girl standing by the side of the road trying to get a ride to her father's house. And everyone who has experienced it has made a point of reporting the girl's eyes. They were haunting yeah, they certainly were. Well, so I picked up a ghost and took her home, huh? <laughs> See, that'll be something to remember. Yes. Well, look, now will you tell me why all this business about you being jealous? Oh, well, it was just too good an opportunity, sweetheart. I just wanted to be sure that you'd never look at another girl again, oh. no matter what kind of eyes she had. <laughs> Thinking it over later, there was something that neither Tom nor Lucille could puzzle out. Before reaching Ethel Wyman's home, Tom had taken a left fork at the bottom of Long Hill, then crossed a covered bridge. Retracing that route in daylight, he found that neither the fork in the road nor the bridge existed. The road ended at an abutment, and beyond it lay Great Hollow Reservoir, built 40 years before. Tune in at this same time for Walter Gibson, your expert on the supernatural. Stories of ghosts, of spirits, werewolves, and voodoo. And each story you hear is true, but strange. Strange with Walter Gibson as your expert was directed by Bill Marshall. In the cast were Mary Patton and Hal Holbrook. This is Charles Wood speaking. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked.
the Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense, Columbia's play theater of outstanding thrillers, produced and directed by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann. The notable melodramas from fiction and stage and screen, from the world's great literature of entertaining excitement, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Tonight's story, by America's distinguished author playwright Owen Johnson, gathers its suspense in a very gentle way. It doesn't have a spectacular finish, garnished with revolver shots. There are no graveyard watches. There's not so much as a single lifeless body, identified or unidentified. It's a tale told in a club room, the Artists and Writers Club in New York. A tale of high-class robbery and suspicion and of how some ladies and gentlemen nervously counted 100 in the dark. Ah, that was a fine meal. Me for the club any time. Uh, here, we can all sit here, Freddy. Yes, if you'll just draw up that chair for Mr. Peters. Oh, yeah, thank you. Peters. Thank you. Uh, do you all know Peters? Uh, this is Mr. Steingall. Well, how do you do? I know you. Uh, Mr. Gollier? Oh, I, I believe we've met. Oh, yes. 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 How are you? Oh, you know each other. Yes, yes, yes. And the one who drew up the chair, Mr. Rankin. How do you do? Thank well, you I, guess, I, I guess we're all acquainted now. Um, to get back to our table discussion, Quinny. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, how about a drink? Who'll join me? Oh, yeah, yeah, pleasure. Fine, yeah. fine. Yeah. fine. Yeah. Uh, John. Well, now, Steingall, as I said... There are only half a dozen stories in the world. What is more to the point? There's every reason yes, to... Yes, sir. What? Oh. Uh, five uh, with soda, John. Yes, sir. Now, now, where was I? Oh, oh, yes. What is more to the point, gentlemen, is the small number of human relations that are so simple and yet so fundamental that they can be eternally played upon, redressed and reinterpreted in every language, in every age, and yet remain inexhaustible in the possibility of variation. Well, that's true, of course. It's very possible. Take the eternal triangle. Two men and a woman, or two women and a man. Its variations extend to thousands. That right, Rankin? Well, in a way. Ah, here we are. Uh, Set them down right there, John. Very well, sir. Uh, A little soda. Uh, here you are. Uh, thank you. And you? Uh, 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 soda, Peter? Yes, please. Uh, another one. Here you are. Thanks. And here's yours. Thank you. And now, a little soda in mine. Uh, well, here's to you all. Cheers. Cheers, cheers. cheers. <coughs> <coughs> I'm afraid we can't see eye to eye, Quinny. I believe there are situations, original situations, that are independent of your human emotions, that exist just because they are situations, accidental and nothing else. As for instance? Well, I'll just cite an ordinary one that happens to come to my mind. In a group of five men, well, such as we are here, a theft takes place. One man is the thief. Now, which one? Now, I'd like to know what emotion that interprets. And yet it certainly is an original theme at the bottom of the whole literature. It's not the same thing at all. Ah, detective stories. I could answer that the situation you give can be traced back to the commonest of human emotions. Curiosity. I think uh, Quinny has you there, Rankin. Hmm. What is the peculiar fascination that the detective problem exercises over the human mind? You will say, curiosity. Hmm, Yes. And no. Admit at once that the whole art of a detective story consists in the statement of the problem. Anyone can do it. I can do it. Steingall can do it. Uh, Rankin, I believe even you can do it. (laughs) (laughs) The solution doesn't count. It is usually banal. It should be prohibited. 
What interests us is, can we guess it? There you have it. The problem, the detective story. Now, why the fascination? I'll tell you. It appeals to our curiosity. Yes. But deeper, to a sort of intellectual vanity. Five men present. The theft takes place. Who's the thief? Who will guess it first? Whose brains will show its superior cleverness? You see? That's all. That's all there is to it. Out of all of which, the interesting thing is that Rankin has supplied the reason why the supply of detective fiction is inexhaustible. It does all come down to the simplest terms. Five possibilities, one answer. Well, the reason is that the situation does constantly occur. It's a situation that any of us might get into any time. Yes, I know of an incident of that kind that happened to a friend of mine last month. Of course, of course, gentlemen, you are glorifying commonplaces. Every crime, I tell you, expresses itself in the terms of the picture puzzle that you feed to your six-year-old. It's only the variation that is interesting. Take the well-known instance of the visitor at a club and the rare coin, for example. You all know that story. You've heard uh, it, haven't you? I don't oh, think I have. I'm not sure. Why, it's, it's very well known. Oh, go ahead, Quinny. Tell it. A distinguished visitor is brought into a club. A dozen men, say, present at dinner, long table. Conversation finally veers around to curiosities and relics. One of the members present then takes from his pocket what he announces as one of the rarest coins in existence. Passes it around the table. Coin travels back and forth, everyone examining it. And the conversation goes to another topic. All at once, the owner calls for his coin. It is nowhere to be found. Everyone looks at everyone else. First, they suspect a joke. Then it becomes serious. The coin is immensely valuable. Who has taken it? The owner is a gentleman. Does the gentlemanly, idiotic thing, of course. Laughs as he knows someone is playing a practical joke on him and that the coin will be returned tomorrow. The others refuse to leave the situation so. One man proposes that they all submit to a search. Everyone gives his assent until it comes to the stranger. He refuses, curtly, roughly, without giving any reason. Uncomfortable silence. The man is a guest. No one knows him particularly well, but still he is a guest. One member tries to make him understand that no offense is offered. That the suggestion was simply to clear the atmosphere. The stranger becomes very firm, very proud, and says, I refuse to allow my person to be searched, and I refuse to give the reason for my action. Another silence. The visitor evidently has the coin, but he is their guest, and etiquette protects him. <laughs> nice situation, eh? Well, what's the well. answer? The table is cleared. A waiter removes a dish of fruit, and there, under the ledge of the plate, where it's been pushed, is the coin. Banal explanation, eh? Of course. Solutions always should be. At once, everyone apologizes to him. Whereupon the visitor rises and says, Now I can give you the reason for my refusal to be searched. There are only two known specimens of that coin in existence. And the second happens to be here in my vest pocket. That's rather obvious. <laughs> of course, the story is well invented. But the turn to it is very nice. Very nice, indeed. Well, I don't know. The ending is very unsatisfactory. The visitor should have hit on him not another coin, but uh, something absolutely different. Something... Uh, destructive, say, of a, a woman's reputation, and a great tragedy should have been threatened by the casual misplacing of the coin. Well, I've heard the same story told in a dozen different ways. Oh, it's happened a hundred times. It must continually happen. I know of one extraordinary instance, in fact, the most extraordinary instance of this sort I've ever heard. Peters, you rascal. I see you've been quietly letting us set the stage for you. Well, it's <laughs> not a story that will please everyone. Why not? Because you will want to know what no one can ever know. It has no conclusion, then? Yes and no. As far as it concerns a woman, quite the most remarkable woman I've ever met, the story is complete. Uh, do I know the woman? Possibly. Probably, I should say. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, this should be particularly interesting to you because <clears throat> I believe that most of you are acquainted with the people involved. Uh, the names, of course, are disguised. I think... Uh, yes, I have. Just time before I catch my train to tell it to you. This is, well, Mrs. Rita Kildare. Inhabited a charming bachelor girl studio. Very elegant. The duplex pattern in one of the buildings just off Central Park West. 
She knew very nearly everyone in that indescribable society in New York that's drawn from all levels and that imposes but one condition for membership, to be amusing. In this mingled society, her invitations were eagerly sought. Her dinners were spontaneous, and the discussions, though gay and usually daring, were invariably under the control of wit and good taste. On the Sunday night of this adventure, she had, according to our custom, sent away her Filipino butler and invited to an informal chafing dish supper seven of her more unusual friends. At seven o'clock, having finished dressing, she put in order her bedroom, which formed a sort of free passage between the studio and a small dining room to the kitchen beyond. Then, going into the studio, she struck a match and was about to light the candlesticks which illuminated the room when the bell rang, and a Mr. Flanders, a broker, compact, nervously alive, well-groomed, was waiting as she opened the door. Well, you're early. On the contrary, you are late. <laughs> well, in any case, hello, and come inside. Here, let me take your things. Thank you. Well, I'm the first, I suppose. Of course. And since you are, you can be a good boy and help me with the candles. I'm delighted. Who's to be here tonight? The Enos Jacksons. I thought they were separated. Not yet. How interesting. Only you, dear lady, would dream of serving us a couple on the verge. It is interesting, isn't it? Assuredly. Uh, where did you know Jackson? Through the Warings. Uh, Jackson's a rather doubtful person, isn't he? Uh, well, let's call him a very sharp lawyer. Uh, they tell me, though, he's been gambling pretty much. In deep. How about yourself? Oh, me? I'm a bachelor. If I lose my shirt, it makes no difference. Is that possible? Probably even. Who else is coming? Oh, uh, Maud Lilly. You know her? No, I don't think so. You met her here some time ago. A journalist. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I'd forgotten. Mr. Harris, the clubman, is coming, and the Stanley Cheevers. Stanley Cheevers? Are we going to gamble? Don't tell me you object. <laughs> Certainly not. Only the Cheevers. <laughs> they play quite a game. Yes, well united. <laughs> they have an unusual streak of good luck. <laughs> oh, by the way, it's uh, Jackson, isn't it, who is so attractive to Mrs. Cheever? Quite right. What a charming party. Hey, where does Maud Lilly come in? Don't joke. She's in a desperate way. And young Harris? Oh, he's to make the salad and cream the chicken. Ah, see the whole party. I, of course, am to add the element of respectability. Of what? Don't play baby with me, my dear Flanders. I apologize. That's better. No one, of course, knows who else is coming. No one, of course. The Stanley Cheevers entered. A short, fat man with a vacant, fat face and slow-moving eye. And his wife, voluble, nervous, overdressed, and pretty. Mr... Yes, Mr. Harris came in with Maud Lilly. A woman, straight, dark, Indian, great masses of somber hair, held in a little too loosely for neatness, with thick, quick lips and eyes that rolled away from the person who was talking to her. The Enos Jacksons were late, and still agitated as they entered. His forehead had not quite banished the scowl, nor her eyes the scorn. He was of the type that never lost his temper, but caused others to lose theirs. Mrs. Jackson seemed fastened to her husband by an invisible leash. You looked at her curiously and wondered what such a nature would do in a crisis with a lurking sense of a woman who carried with her her own impending tragedy. As soon as the company had been completed and the incongruity of the selection had been perceived, a smile of malicious anticipation ran the rounds, which the hostess cut short by saying... Well, well, now that everyone's here, this is the order for the night. You can quarrel all you want, you can whisper all the gossip you can think of about one another, but everyone is to be amusing. Also, everyone is to help with dinner. And nothing formal, nothing serious. We may all be bankrupt, divorced, or dead tomorrow, but tonight we'll be gay. That's the invariable rule of the house. <laughs> Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll get...
get on with the cooking. Uh, Harris, I'll need you. Right with you. May I be of any help? Thank you, Maud, dear. Oh, Mrs. Cheever. Come on. You might come along, too. All right. This is an adorable bedroom. Oh, thank you, dear. Uh, now for my apron. Oh, there it is. Uh, tie me up in the back, will you please, Maud? Of course. There you are. Fine, thanks. Now, just let me get my rings off, and I'll be all ready to go to work. Oh, this is such a lovely apartment, Mrs. Kildare. Thanks. Soap and water always seem to do it. Ah, there. Your rings are so beautiful. They are nice, aren't they? But there's only one that's very valuable, the sapphire. Oh, it's beautiful. Let me see. Oh, well, it must be very valuable. It cost 10000 six years ago. Mm. It's been my talisman ever since. For the moment, however, I'm a cook. You're not going to leave the rings there. Why, of course. Now, I'm the cook. Uh, Maud Lily, you're the scullery maid. Harris is the chef, and we're all under his orders. Mrs. Cheever, mm. did you ever peel onions? Oh, good heavens, no. <laughs> well, there are no onions to peel. <laughs> all you have to do is help set the table. <laughs> Under their hostess's gay guidance, the seven guests began to circulate busily through the room, laying the table, grouping the chairs, opening bottles, and preparing the material for the chafing dishes. Mrs. Kildare, in the kitchen, ransacked the icebox, and with her own hands shredded the chicken and measured the cream. Flanders, carry this in carefully. Cheever! Stop watching your wife and put the salad bowl on the table. <laughs> Everything ready, Harris? All set. All right. Uh, everyone sit down. I'll be right in. She went into her bedroom, took off her apron, and hung it in the closet. Then going to her dressing table, she drew the hat pin around which were her rings from the pin cushion and carelessly slipped them on her fingers. But all at once, she frowned and looked quickly at her hand. Only two rings were there. The third ring, the sapphire, was missing. Stupid. She said to herself and returned to her dressing table. Immediately she stopped. She remembered quite clearly putting the hat pin through the three rings. She made no attempt to search further, but remained without moving, her fingers slowly drumming on the table. Who had taken the ring? Each of her guests had had a dozen opportunities in the course of the time she'd been busy in the kitchen. She ran over their characters and their situations as she knew them. Strangely enough, at each, her mind stopped upon some reason that might explain a sudden temptation. To find out nothing this way. That's not the important thing to me just now. The important thing is to get the ring back. And slowly, deliberately, she began to walk back and forth, a clenched hand beating the deliberate, rhythmic measure of her journey. Five minutes later, as Harris installed the chef over the chafing dish, was giving directions, spoon in the air, Mrs. Kildare came into the room like a lengthening shadow. Her entrance had been made with scarcely a perceptible sound, and yet each guest was aware of it at the same moment with a little nervous start. Heavens, heavens, dear lady. You come in on us like a Greek tragedy. What is it you have for us, a surprise? I have something to say to you. Mr. Enos Jackson. Yes, Miss Kilder? Kindly do as I ask you. Well, certainly. Go to the door. Go to the door? Please. Yes? Lock it. And bring me the key. Here you are. You've locked it? As you wish me to. Thank you. Now, the bedroom door. Would you do the same? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Cheever. Yeah? Would you blow out all the candles except the candelabra on the table? Blow out all the candles? Except the candelabra. All right. Well, uh, for goodness sake, Mrs. Kildare. What is it? I am getting terribly worked up. I, my I'm nerves are all sorry, on edge. Mrs. Jackson. 
That's the last candle. All right. Now listen. My sapphire ring has just been stolen. What? You don't mean it. The ring's been taken within the last 20 minutes. I'm not going to mince words. The ring has been taken, and the thief is among you. But Mrs. Kildare, is it possible? Yes, Mrs. Cheever. There's not the slightest doubt. Three of you were in the bedroom when I placed my rings on the pincushion. Quite true. I was in the room when she took them off. The sapphire ring was on top. Each of you has passed through there a dozen times since. My sapphire ring is gone, and one of you has taken it. For heaven's sake. Now, now listen. I'm not going to miss words. I'm not going to stand on ceremony. But I'm going to have my ring back. Listen to me carefully. I'm going to have that ring back. And until I do, not a soul shall leave this room. I don't care who's taken it. All I want is my ring. Now, I'm going to make it possible for whoever took it to restore it without possibility of detection. The doors are locked and will stay locked. I'm going to blow out the remaining candles in the candelabra. And we're going to count 100 slowly. There'll be an absolute darkness. No one will know or see what's done. If, at the end of that time, the ring is not here on the table, I shall telephone the police and have everyone in this room searched. Uh, well, do am I quite clear? Everyone take his place about the table and uh, remain standing, please. That's it. That'll do. Now, I'll blow out the candles and count 100. No more, no less. Remember, either I get that ring... Or everyone in this room will be searched. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, <coughs> twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, Thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, What's forty-five. That? Foot slapped off the chair. I'm sorry. Forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, fifty. Fifty-one, fifty-two, fifty-three, fifty-four, fifty-five, fifty-six, fifty-seven, fifty-eight, fifty-nine, sixty, sixty-one, sixty-two, sixty-three, sixty-four, sixty-five, sixty-six, sixty-seven, sixty-eight, sixty-nine, seventy, seventy-one, seventy-two. Seventy-three. The ring. Seventy-four. Well, there it is. On the table. Seventy-five. Oh, it is. Seventy-six. Yes. Seventy-seven. Seventy-eight. Seventy-nine. Eighty. Eighty-one. Eighty-two. Eighty-three. Eighty-four. Eighty-five. Eighty-six. Eighty-seven. Eighty-eight. Oh, really? Eighty-nine. Ninety. Ninety-one. Ninety-two. Ninety-three, ninety-four, ninety-five, ninety-six, ninety-seven, ninety-eight, ninety-nine, one hundred. Well, well, it is there, isn't it? Mr. Cheever, you may hand it to me. Well, now that that's over, we can have a very gay little supper. The light, someone.
And there you are, gentlemen. Oh, I say, Peters, that's not all. Absolutely. The story ends there? Story ends there. But uh, who took the ring? <laughs> what? You mean, never found out? Never. No clue? None. I'm not sure I like the story. Uh, it's no story at all. Permit me, it is a story. And it is complete. In fact, I consider it unique because it has none of the banalities of a solution and leaves the problem even more confused than at the start. Well, I don't of see... Of course what... you don't see, my dear Enkin. You do not see that any solution would be commonplace, whereas no solution leaves an extraordinary intellectual problem. Well, how so? Well, in the first place, whether the situation actually happened or not, which is in itself a mere triviality, Peters has constructed it in a masterly way, the proof of which is that he has made me listen. Any of those present might have taken the ring. There are therefore seven solutions, all possible and all logical. But beyond this is left a great intellectual problem. Well, how so? Was it a woman who lacked the necessary courage to continue? Or was it a man who repented his first impulse? Is a man or is a woman the greater natural criminal? Oh, that's simple, Quinny. A woman took it, of course. You know, on the contrary, it was a man, for the second action was more difficult than the first. A man, certainly. The restoration of the ring was a logical decision. You see? Personally, I incline to a woman, for the reason that a weaker feminine nature is strangely susceptible to the domination of her own sex. There you are. We could meet and debate the subject year in and year out and never agree. Uh, I, I recognize most of the characters, Peters. Uh, Mrs. Kildare, of course, is all you say of her. An extraordinary woman. The story is quite characteristic of her. Flanders, I'm not sure of, but I think I know him. I'm positive I do. Did it really happen? Exactly as I told it. The only one I don't recognize is Harris, your humble servant. What? You, Peters? You were there? I was there. I was Harris. I beg your pardon, gentlemen. Oh, yes, what is it, John? Mr. Peters, sir, your train. You told me to remind you. Oh, thank you. Yes, I didn't know it was so late. Will you gentlemen pardon me? Huh? Uh, of course. Oh, yes, sir. Nice to meet you all. <clears throat> Night. Uh, Curious chap. Extraordinary. Well, now, I... I wonder... I wonder if we're wondering the same thing, gentlemen. And so, with the enigmatic smile of Mr. Peters, or Harris, ends 100 in the Dark, Owen Johnson's smooth story which gave us tonight's... Suspense. Suspense is produced by William Spear. Tonight's radio drama was written by Jack Anson Fink, directed by John Dietz, and scored by Bernard Herman. Eric Dressler was Mr. Peters. Alice Frost played Mrs. Kildare, and Ted Osborne, Quinny. Others in the cast were Helen Lewis, Joan Shea, Henriette Kay, Frank Reddick, Paul Luther, Stefan Schnabel, Ian Martin, and Barry Kroger. With this evening's performance, Columbia brings to a conclusion the present series of Suspense. If you've liked these broadcasts, CBS would be pleased to hear from you. Suspense has been a series presented for your relaxation and enjoyment by the Columbia Broadcasting System. As you know, I've been working to lose weight for a while, but I love bread, which is pretty much 100% carbs. One slice of wheat bread is about 12 carbs. That's 24 carbs if you're making a sandwich, and that's just the bread before you put anything into the sandwich. But I saw an ad online for Hero Bread that claimed zero carbs. I was skeptical. I tried other zero-carb breads in the past that were absolutely horrid. But I clicked and ordered a loaf of their seed bread and their white bread. 
Not only did it feel and taste like actual bread, I've gone back to making sandwiches like I did before my low-carb diet. I can have a grilled cheese without worry. I make many pizzas by toasting the white bread and using it like pizza crust. So I went back and found that Hero Bread also has hot dog buns, so I jumped on that. Again, zero carbs. They have zero-carb hamburger buns, dinner rolls, tortillas, and more, even croissants. I asked them if I could please work with them and they said yes, so now you can get Hero Bread by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. And if you create a subscription, you can even save 10% on everything you order. If low carb is your life right now, try Hero. WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. Mystery House. Mystery House, that strange publishing firm owned by Dan and Barbara Glenn where each new novel is acted out by the Mystery House staff before it is accepted for publication. Mystery House. Say, Barb, you said the novel we're acting out for Mystery House tonight has a detective who never even sees the scene of the crime. That's technically correct, Dan. At least she never gets on the premises. She? Yes. The girl's an invalid. Oh, that sounds impossible. Oh, now, don't use that word, Mr. Glenn. Nothing's impossible. No, well, I can think of a good many things that nobody's ever been able to do. Well, I can remember when people said it would be impossible to make the radio commercials as interesting as the show itself. But listen to this. Okay, places everybody. Set the scene, will you, Tom? Death passed my window. A story about a young girl who lives in that section of an industrial city where the tenements sit in squalid rows, side by side, with only a few feet between. My name is Hope Gray. I've been a hopeless invalid for eight years, ever since the night a hit-and-run driver struck me down. I lie in my bed now in a dingy room of a crowded, faded tenement. My one window stares at a window in another tenement, almost directly opposite. That window and the girl who lives behind it have become friends of mine. Morning, Hope. How's the back today? Much better, thanks, Jenny. If you were telling the truth, you'd have the finest back in the world. Always better. Every morning. Did Eddie bring you home last night, Jenny? Yep, as per usual. Why don't you bring him up to your room sometime, Jenny, and get him in front of your window so I can see him? Hey, not so fast, chum. Nice girls don't bring their boyfriends to their rooms. Even when the girl happens to be a nightclub dancer and the boy's a sax player in the dance band. I'll bet he's handsome. No, I wouldn't say he's handsome. But he's kind of a sweet kid. He can sit in a crowded, noisy, smoky nightclub all night long, night after night, and, and still not be there at all. Know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The way I go sailing out on the lake in a little racing sloop, like I shop the beautiful stores on the avenue. Poor kid. You with your one little window. But I do have one window. You know, Jenny, I sometimes wonder if people realize what wonderful inventions windows are. You silly goose. Well, I got a lot to do this morning. Got to sew up some costumes. So long. Jenny's days and nights are all mixed up, like mine. It isn't really morning, 
but four o'clock in the afternoon. Being in bed 24 hours of a day, year after year, you forget about day and night. Time is just something to fill the best you can. It goes on, on, and on. Night. The hours from ten to three. Those are the hardest. Nothing but blackness outside my window. The complete blackness of night. Sometimes I wish Ginny wasn't a dancer. But then I'd miss the funny little squeak one of the floorboards always makes when she practices her dance step. Her visits mean so much to me. Morning, Hopeful. What you reading? Hi, Jenny. The new mystery in the honey. Oh, I'll bet it's good. Oh, just that everything in the whole world is good. Oh, what are you so happy about? Take a gander. See? I know it's small, but you can see it from there, can't you? The way it glistens. Oh, it's a diamond ring. It wouldn't exactly blind you, but it's real. Eddie? Yeah. We're going to be married. Oh, wonderful. It sounds simply terrific. Oh, he isn't really cute, but he's nice and a square guy. Oh, Jenny, you've got to let me see him. I'll just die if you don't. I'll bring him over to your room some night. Promise? It's a promise, hopeful. Cross my heart. And hope to die? No, just cross my heart. The way I feel now, I think I'd like to live forever. <laughs> Days and nights form a pattern, not all alike, but each like some remembered one from the past. One I know I've lived before, and one I'll live again. Ready for me to turn out your light, dear? Yes, thank you, Mother. I brought you something for tomorrow, honey. Oh, what? It's one of the Flamand stories, The Case of the Insolent Pin. I got it from the rental library. Oh, gee, it's a big book. Oh, Mother, you're wonderful. <laughs> Good night, dear. Night again. The hours from ten to three. Nothing but black night. <gasps> what? Light. A light in Jenny's room. Jenny! Jenny, how come you're home so early? She must be opening a wooden box. Maybe it's something she doesn't want me to see. Jenny! Oh, it's squeaky place on the floor. She's fixing it. And I wish she wouldn't. I'll miss it. A lighted cigarette stub being thrown out of the window. And Jenny doesn't smoke. Why didn't Jenny answer me? I guess she brought Eddie up to fix the squeaky board. She didn't want me to know he was there. But I didn't mean to be nosy. She has a right to a little privacy. I, I just won't say anything to her about it. Top of the morning, hopeful. Hello, Jenny. When are you going to bring Eddie around? Gosh, honey, I've been so doggone busy. I... I see you finally got around to fixing the squeaky board in your floor. You could hear that squeaky board way over your place? Of course. It must have fixed itself then. I didn't do anything. Oh. Oh, I... Well, I, I guess lots of things do fix themselves at that. Work hard last night? No, harder than usual. But we have a late show tonight. Got to practice a little. Be seeing you, hopeful. Twelve o'clock. And 
And Jenny's light just went on again. Oh, this is wrong. Before the pattern lost its form, it was never like this. Never. It's not right, Evie. Ah, oh, you're jittery, huh? Your imagination's working overtime. I don't imagine things, Eddie. I would have asked to get off early tonight and come back here just for imagination. I'm afraid. Oh, Jenny. Eddie, let's get married tonight. Tonight? At this hour? Why, nobody's around. We could find someone. When you and I get married, we'll do it right. For keeps. Come in. Oh. I better. I, I guess so. Yeah, I better be going now. I, I didn't have any right up here. Oh, oh, just a minute before you go. Hope. Hope you awake? Oh, sure, Jenny. I just woke up. You been home long? Uh, no. Stick your head over in front of the window, Eddie. Hello. I can't see you, but if you're a friend of Jenny's, I like you. Hello, Eddie. That's Hope Graves. You know, the girl I was telling you about. Glad to know you, Hope. Well, I, I have to be running along now. Oh, uh, will you, uh, will you do something for me before you go, Eddie? Sure, kid. Anything you say. Well, uh, will you uh, kiss Jenny goodnight in front of the window? <laughs> sure. How was that, Hope? What? It was beautiful. <laughs> Four o'clock in the afternoon. Time for Jenny to pull up her shade and start her day. But really nice. It's funny. I've never been jealous of Jenny's dancing feet. But today I am. She has a Prince Charming. And I'll never have one. I'll go on getting excitement from books. But I'll think of Jenny and her Eddie. I'll think of the misty sparkle in her eyes when Eddie kissed her last night. I'll think of it because it was so wonderful. And because I... I can't have it. Ever. Funny that Ginny hasn't raised her window shade yet. <laughs> oh. Probably dreaming of Eddie. But she should be up now. Jenny! Jenny! Jenny, you lazy buns, get up! It's time for you to get up! Oh, Jenny! Jenny! Is something wrong? Answer me, please! Jenny! I'm worried about you! Say something, please! Jenny! All right, open up, miss. You got your landlady worried. It's Emmett Bryant, Virginia. You know, the cop on the corner. Come on now, open the door like a good girl. Out of the house ordinarily she is, but this time, Officer Bryant, I called and called and it don't do no good. Virginia, are you opening the door now? Answer me. You got a pass key, Mr. Schultz? No. These doors all got the spring locked. And the key to this one is locked. All right, stand back there, Mrs. Schultz. There's nothing for it but to bust in the door. See? Oh! Wait. Saints have mercy on her soul. That poor little kid, her head all caved in with a hammer. Wait a minute. What's this? Why, well, it looks like a long, heavy, black silk necklace. Yeah, but it's got a snap hook on it. No, it ain't a necklace, Mrs. Schultz. What is it, then? And I think maybe it's something that's going to hang a man. No, Officer Brian, no. You're all wrong. I know what that thing is, and you're wrong. Oh, I am, am I? Oh, yes. Well, what is it, then? Well, it's a thing saxophone players wear around their necks to hold their instruments. Yeah, that's what I thought it was. Oh, but it couldn't be, Eddie. It, it just couldn't be. Oh, Eddie, huh? So Virginia had a boyfriend named Eddie, and he left a saxophone card in her room. You know when he left it? Oh, well, I... No. No, I don't. You know his last name. You know where he lives. No. You don't know or you just won't tell me? I said I didn't know. I heard you. But I've been around this neighborhood too long to be fooled all the time. Now, if you do know anything, kid, you should tell it fast. Why? If you know something that would pin a murder on somebody, that somebody would try another murder to keep me from getting the answer. And you wouldn't be able to defend yourself very well. (laughs) 
Is Officer Brian right? Will the murderer strike again? And now, Act Two of Death Past My Window opens at the battered door of the murdered girl's apartment. Somebody is knocking. Ginny, you're late for work. What's the matter, honey? Jenny! Jenny! What? What the devil? A cop? What are you doing here? Where's Jenny? She's down at headquarters, kid. Oh, no. She hasn't done anything. Take me to her right away. It ain't a bad act, kid. You almost convinced me. Almost. What are you talking about? Sit down. I want to see Jenny. She's late for work right now. She ain't going to work, kid. Ever. What? What are you trying to say? You already know. I don't know a thing. Quit torturing me. You've got to tell me. Something's happened. What is it? Well, Virginia's had an accident, Eddie. A bad accident. Her head was all caved in with a hammer early this morning. Oh, no. Oh, you're lying. No. No. It isn't true. It isn't true. It isn't true. This is death I've met. It passed my window, not 20 feet away. And yet, invisible. In detective stories, death is always exciting. But this was Jenny, my friend. And it isn't exciting at all. It's just horrible. Where were you at 4 o'clock this morning, Eddie? I... I don't know. Did you bring Virginia home? Uh, yes, yes, I did. How did you get into her room? I didn't get into her room. Eddie, no. Brian knows you were there. He found your saxophone cord. Hope, tell him. Tell him I didn't kill Jenny. I've already told him, Eddie. You mean you told me you didn't see him do it. But that doesn't mean he couldn't have. All right, come on, Eddie. Where? Down to the police station. Well, you're making a mistake, Officer Brian. Don't worry, Eddie. Everything will come out all right. Worry? I'm through worry. There's nothing to worry about or hope for or... I dream about anymore. And everything won't come out all right. It's no good, kid. Goodbye, Eddie. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Hope. Hope. That's a good one, that is. Brian caught the murderer, huh? Took him to the station. Ah, such goings on. What are you doing in Jenny's room, Mrs. Schultz? Brian told me I could move her things to the basement storage. Uh, Mrs. Schultz, will you call Officer Brian for me? What for? Tell him I want to talk to him. That I have some important information. But you have already told him all you know. No, no, there's a great deal more. There is an old proverb, Hope. Murder, though it have no tongue, will speak? No. People who look for trouble... Usually, find it. Officer Bryant, will you do what I ask, then? Well, now, that all depends. No, that won't do. You'll have to promise. I'm making no promises. You wouldn't want to convict an innocent man, would you? No. Promise? Well, all right. It'll involve some irregular procedure, uh, maybe illegal. Uh, here now, that's not fair. You promised. Yes, all right, all right. What is it you want me to do? I want you to go over next door and rip loose one of the moldings on a window in every apartment on the fourth floor except Jenny. Y- what? Does a Brian go back on his word? Uh, well, I know one thing. After this, one Brian will learn to say no. Did 
Did you get them all, Officer Bryan? Yeah, fake phone calls to get people out, breaking and entering, destruction of property. <laughs> and me a policeman, too. Yeah, I got every apartment on the fourth floor. And may Captain O'Houlihan never hear of it. Well, thanks, Brian. Now, all you have to do is wait. Wait? Sit over here in this room all by myself and wait? Wait for what? Just wait. And don't worry about being alone. We can visit. Hey, listen. Some of my destruction's being repaired. Yes. That's apartment 4D, isn't it? Sounds like it. Mr. and Mrs. Gutowski. He's a section hand. And he's not the one. Not the one? What are you talking about? Never mind. Just wait. Try to have patience. Young lady, did you have me tear loose all of those moldings just so you could hear a hammer serenade? Now, that's three been fixed so far, and all you say is, that's not the one. That's not it either. Oh, that's not it either. That's not it either. How, how long do you expect me to sit in this room listening to people pounding nails? That's four moldings fixed. Only two to go. Oh, Sure. I rip loose the window moldings and the people fix them. That's supposed to prove that the saxophone player didn't murder the girl. Huh. Maybe I'm nuts. Brian! What? That's it. Huh? What apartment's it coming from? Uh, uh, 4C across the hall. Get him, Brian, quick. Get him before he runs away. He killed Jenny. <laughs> Yeah, who's that? Officer Bryan, open up. Well, you don't have to be tough about it. What do you want? I want you to step across the hall. The room where the bank got murdered? <laughs> no thanks, pal, not me. Come on. You step over here by this window, mister. Huh? What for? Hope. Is this the man? Yes. Yes, it has to be him. Say, what kind of a gag is this? I've never seen this girl before in my life. How about that, Hope? Oh, he's quite right. I've never seen him before either. See, Copper? But he killed Jenny, and I can prove it. Hey, you don't look too healthy, sister. But it's less healthy to make cracks like that if you can't back them up. First, Officer Bryan, there's a wide pine floor in that room, isn't there? I've never seen it. Yeah, that's right. Wide pine. Lie down on the bed, Brian, and then get up. Y what? Oh, all right. Okay. Your foot, Brian. Keep it right there on the board it touched when you got up. Mark the board with your pencil. What goes, sister? You ain't gonna rope me in on any funny business. Getting interested, mister? All right, Brian. Get a hammer and pry up that board. Well, it still sounds crazy to me, but it, uh, I might as well, I guess. No, oh, no, you don't, copper. What? Stay right where you are. Put down that gun, you. You'll get a bullet from it right through your thick head if you make a move. I'll keep your hands in the air while I take your gun. And don't get any idea. What are you gonna do? First, I'm gonna do what the bright girl suggested. I'm going to pry up that board. Then I'm going to nick you enough so you won't follow me. And I'm taking on the land. Money. I've never seen so much money in my life. About 30 grand, copper. Your nice, crisp folding dough. Yeah, but the checks, all them checks, what about them? Ah, don't be dumb all your life, copper. That's the racket. The checks are hot. Lifted out of mailboxes. I got kids shoving hot checks all over town. I rented the room across the hall because I knew the dancer was in home nights when I'd be collecting dough and passing out the stolen check to my shills. I needed a sure, safe hiding place for the stuff. Yeah, and Virginia was working with you? She didn't even know there was such a guy as me. Until she came home early with Eddie. Yeah, yeah, that's right. She found cigarette ashes on her floor and a ground-out stuff right in front of my door. And she was dumb enough to start asking questions. I couldn't have her asking questions. You'll never get away with this, lad. Get back, cover, I'll out shoot. I mean business. Hey, yeah. my eyes, my eyes, I can't see. Try to shoot me, will you? Uh, all right. Lay off me, copper. Yeah. You don't have to be so rough about it. I'll be rough, all right. I can't see you, Brian. Is everything all right? Yeah, honey. Thanks to your face and that mirror in this guy's eyes, he'd have shot me sure if you hadn't blinded him. I won't forget that either, sister. Ah, uh, well, what you remember or forget ain't going to be of much importance, lad. I've got a feeling that you ain't going to be around long. <laughs> Yes, 
My name is still Hope Graves. I'm still a bedridden invalid. Yet, somehow, I don't feel at all like the same person who started to tell this story. The pattern has shifted back to its usual form. But for me, things will never be the same. I'll always know it can change. That my routine isn't set in a drab, colorless schedule that will never vary. Life, even for me, can be exciting. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Any okay. Okay. Whatever you say. If you take one step across that roof, I'll jump. Yeah. That's what a few of those jerks down there in the street want you to do. Jump. Theater Five presents Jump, Jump. standing there on the edge of the roof, the Hotel Phyllis roof, must have been about ten feet away from me, I guess. Sandy-haired fellow in his late twenties, I figured. Kind of an Ivy League type. Slight. Dressed pretty good. I wouldn't have any trouble if I could get a hold on him, but uh, from the way he looked at my cop's uniform, I could see that I'd have to go very easy. He didn't trust me. He didn't trust anybody. Hey, uh, fella? Can you hear me? Hey, you up there on the edge of the roof. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. But not very well. I'd like to talk to you. Go ahead, talk. Well, I don't want to holler. Can I move up a bit? Like, uh... Up to that vent pipe. Okay? All right. To the pipe, but no further. Hey, that's better. What's your name, mister? What difference does that make? Oh, it's red tape. I gotta make out a report. You know. Well, if it's easier for you, I'm Jonathan Weldon. Weldon, huh? Weldon. Jonathan Weldon? Yeah. Hey, don't I know that name like, uh, you're a writer or something? Or something. Oh, sure, sure, I know. I was reading about your father, Harry, uh, Harry Weldon in Sports Magazine. He's the guy that has the concessions like for, uh, hot dogs, programs, stuff at all these stadiums and the ballparks. Yeah. And you're a book writer, huh? Well, I'm pleased to meet you. I'm, uh, Charles Emery of the 17th Precinct. You can call me Chuck. 
Not for long. Well, you don't want to say a thing like that, Mr. Weldon. That doesn't make sense. Here you are, a young guy. You're pretty healthy, huh? The fact of those, Chuck. Now, your old man is loaded. You're doing what you want, high-class work. It's not like he was some poor slob who didn't know where his next meal was coming from. <laughs> Pal, you got everything. Yeah, from your point of view, not from mine. Something's bothering you. Chuck, that is the understatement of the year. Well, uh, what's in here, Johnny? You got girl trouble? Is that it? Uh, look, officer, if I wanted advice, I'd have gone on the couch. The city of New York isn't paying you to give me free analysis or psychological counseling. Well, could be. But I think you need it. Now, I'm only a cop, but uh, if you give me a fair shake, maybe I can help you clear things up. How about it, huh? Chuck, you're a good cop, but... but it's a long it. way down to that sidewalk, mister. Once you step off, you can't change your mind. So you better be plenty sure you want to take that step. Right? Right. Right, you're right. Give me five minutes. Tell me what's bugging you. And maybe you'll feel different. Don't. Don't edge up on me like that. <laughs> Don't flatter yourself. I got a wife and three kids, Johnny. I'm not going to wrestle with you on the edge of the roof. But I'll be glad to listen to you. All right. I'll tell you why I'm here. Because I don't want to live anymore. My whole world is just disintegrated. Damn, huh? That wasn't the first thing. It started with my last book, The Gingerbread Motel. Huh? <laughs> No, no one else ever heard of it either. Came out two months ago. The greatest reviews you ever saw. Well, what's wrong with that? Critics called it the season's greatest literary achievement. Sensitive, leery, provocative. Oh, that's good. Yeah, sure. So this morning I went to see my publisher, David J. Bernstein. Johnny, look at these reviews. L.A., Dallas, Cleveland, Chicago... Every one of them raves. <laughs> That's quite a collection. Yeah, Dave, I know. I, I've seen most of them, so... Well, I don't understand why you don't advertise more. Well, advertising costs money, Johnny. Yeah, but with these reviews... Well, you... the critics like Gingerbread Motel, Johnny, but we're not getting a response to the award advertising. Yeah, but, but a good book. You know, you have to tell the public. It doesn't happen that way, Johnny. When a book sells, we advertise. When it doesn't, we can't afford to. Gingerbread Motel isn't selling. We'll be lucky if we get back your advance. Well, guess I've been counting chickens. See, with those reviews, Dave, I thought I had a bestseller, maybe even a movie sale. Forget it. Now, let's face it, Johnny. You're a great writer, but you're not a crowd pleaser. Now, if you could only learn to cater to the crowds, maybe you wouldn't be such a good writer, but you'd make a very good living. That's the way this happy day started. Well, okay, Johnny, but just because you're not making a million bucks, well, lots of guys don't. They don't kill themselves. You probably make more than me, and I got a family. I know, but I need more. Just how much more I didn't know until I met my girl for lunch. <laughs> I think, Johnny. At least I think I do. Oh, so, Sylvia, that's the way. That's the way it seems to stand. And you're sure that Bernstein was right? Oh, Dave always tells me the hard facts. And they evidently are all hard. Oh, Sylvia. I know it's a disappointment. Disappointment? Johnny, I don't measure our engagement in years, but in books and broken promises. There have been three of each. Oh, darling, please. Let's not argue. Oh, no argument. But time is passing. Fast. Sylvia, I know it's not the way we plan, but we can get married today if you want. And live on what? Your rave reviews? Johnny, I'm not ready for a Greenwich Village railroad flat. Gee, I thought you were glad I was a writer. Why, well, I am, Johnny. Well, these are just things that can happen to a writer. To you, Johnny. But not to me. I admit I like expensive things, living nicely. You have talent, Johnny, but it won't pay my bills. I see. 
But there is something you can do. You have a father. Make your peace with him. Work in his business and write on the side. Oh, I doubt if Dad will That's do your it. only chance, Johnny. I'm going to be practical this time for both of us. She handed me back my ring, Chuck. Gave me till the next day to get squared away with my father. Otherwise, we were through. Uh, dames. Well, Johnny, dames, like they say, are like trolley cars. You just wait for another. Not like Sylvia. Beautiful. Beautiful, Chuck. I'm sensitive and the only woman I ever wanted to marry. That, well, that's why I swallowed my pride and went to my father's office. That's the deal, Barney. I either get the merchandise at my price or you lose the contract. Call me tomorrow. <laughs> How's that for the old fist, Johnny, huh? The quarters send off each hot dog. You know how much that means to me? Thousand. <laughs> well, Johnny, you're uh, quite a stranger. What can your old man do for you? Well, you uh, once promised me a job, and I need it now. Yeah, how come? Everybody tells me what a great success you are. Oh, I am. Gingerbread Motel got great reviews all over the country. Oh, come off it, Johnny. There's only one kind of success, the kind you can put in a bank. I told you that when you got out of college. Now, I still got a great business here, and it's yours if you'll knock yourself out working for it. That means seven days a week and some nights, the way I did when I built it up, you got a lot to learn. Crowd handling, commissary, accounting, buying. I, I just want a job. I, You see, I don't want to spend my life haggling over the price of frankfurters. I mean, I figured that if I had a job, I could write evenings and weekends. Forget it. I could hire plenty of clock watchers, Johnny. I want to take charge. Dad, of... you don't understand. I want to get married, but well, I can't give up writing. Then write something that sells, boy. You know, I tell you the truth, Johnny. They tell me I should be proud of you. I'd like to. I try reading your books, but I never finished one. They bore me stupid. They got no guts, no excitement. Just like me, Johnny, you got to cater to the crowds or they'll starve you dead. I need help, Dad. I... Can I put it to you more plainly? Yeah, Johnny. Sure you need help. So you can't make terms. Especially with me. Nobody, but nobody dictates to Harry Weldon. Chuck, I walked around. I, I couldn't see any way out. That's why I came up here. I, I want to die. Still? What's the point of living? I have nothing. You got one thing, Johnny. Time. Give me one hour. One lousy hour. That's your public, Johnny. Yelling for your blood. There's quite a mob down there. I don't pay any attention, Johnny. Give me an hour. Please. One hour. No more. When I got Jonathan Weldon to give me his word not to jump off the roof of the Hotel Phyllis for one hour, I felt I'd won half the jackpot. I figured that all I had to do would be to get two other people to the Hotel Phyllis roof to talk to him. His father, Harry Weldon, and his girl, Sylvia. I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Weldon. Come on, this way. Your son's over here. This is a lousy thing for him to have done. I'd like to get my hands on... Excuse me, Mr. Weldon, but if you're going to talk like that to Johnny, you might as well shove him off the roof personally. Now, you talk to him easy, like. And don't try to get too close. Thank you, officer. I'll try my best. Johnny? Johnny, your father's here. Oh? Well, stay there. Stay, stay right there. Johnny... What do you want? 
I want to die. Oh, don't say that, son. I don't get it. Three hours ago, I asked you for a favor, and you practically told me to drop dead. I can't believe you can. Well, of course I do, Johnny. I... Johnny, he's your father. Oh, maybe, but first he's Harry Weldon. Tough Harry Weldon, who can chisel a quarter of a cent off the wholesale price of hot dogs and force anybody, including his son, to do what he wants. Well, maybe I was a little rough on you, Johnny, but that's only because I thought you ought to face up to the facts of life. I... If I hurt your feelings, I'm sorry. Uh, first... You kicked me in the teeth. And I the... said I was sorry. You... Look, if your mother was soft and kind of sensitive, I, I guess it ain't your fault that you took after her, not after me. But I loved her, Johnny. And aside from my own personal feelings, it's all wrong to throw away the life that she gave you. Now, look, there are hundreds of people downstairs in 45th Street, and you're making nothing but a fool of yourself up here. Some... Photographers took my picture when the police pulled me through the crowd, and we're going to be spread all over the newspapers tomorrow. Now, right now, you make up your mind and tell me what you want. I don't want anything from you. That's ridiculous, Johnny. You got me over a barrel. You can make any kind of a deal you want for yourself. Deal? Yeah, I'll give you a thousand dollars to walk away from that edge. For five thousand. Ten thousand, Johnny. 25,000. Johnny, have a heart. All right, all right. 50,000. Think what it would mean to you. You could work in your books, get married if you want, or play around if you want. You wouldn't have to get up every morning and the rest of us slobs during a day's day pay. All right, Johnny, 100,000 and a certified check. The officer here can act as a witness. <laughs> if I don't come across, you can sue me. <laughs> That's your closing bid. Johnny, that's quite a hunk of dough. I mean, it won't break me, but I'll miss it. But if, if you want more... All my life you tried to buy your way, and now you think you can buy my life! My life has never been for sale, and it's not for sale now! Uh, Johnny, Johnny, your father's only trying Get to... Get out of here! Get him out of here, Chuck! <laughs> I led Harry Weldon away, knowing that I had struck out. A couple of minutes later, Sylvia Breton arrived. I took one look at her and knew that she was a great reason for any guy to want to Officer, I'm Sylvia Breton. Where's Johnny? Over near the edge of the uh, roof there. Oh, poor Johnny. Officer, is it my fault? I mean, I, I didn't think he was so attached to me. Now, look, miss, it's a lot of things all rolled up together, but uh, maybe you can help him if you want to. Of course I want to. You just take it easy when you talk to him. Yes. Try to get him away from the edge of the room. You got me? I, I'll, I'll try. Hello, Johnny. Johnny, aren't you going to look at me? That's better. Do you know why I came here, Johnny? Yes. Because the police brought you. Oh, Johnny, that's not nice. No, I suppose not. I came to tell you I was sorry about this afternoon. You know I love you. We wouldn't have been so close for five years. At lunch today, I, I was just trying to be practical. I could be a millstone around your neck, Johnny. I I'm not a thrifty housewife type. But if you think we ought to get married, Johnny, regardless of your financial condition, I'm quite willing. Willing? But not anxious? Oh, please, Johnny. If you love me, don't do this awful thing. I'd always feel guilty. My, my conscience would bother me till the day I died. It would be just too terrible. Oh, please. Come here. Kiss me and put the ring back on my finger. Uh -huh. That would be a little too easy, Sylvia. Then you don't love me. Not as much as I used to, perhaps, but enough to say goodbye. Johnny! Don't you see what that means, Sylvia? I'm giving you what you want most. I'm giving you a clear conscience. You're free, you're absolved of guilt. You can mourn me or not. Whatever makes the best impression on your friends, you've done your duty. I think you better go. Johnny, please! Please, don't! 
Hey, Johnny, I don't get it. Turning down a hundred grand and a beautiful girl like that? Johnny. Johnny, what do you want out of life anyways? You won't gain a thing by ending it all. Yeah, you may wind up way ahead of the game. Okay, come on, Johnny. I'll buy you a drink. In the morning, you'll feel better. <laughs> I bet I would, maybe well enough to start a new book. Oh, sure. Someday you'll hit your own jackpot in your own way, huh? How do I how do I get out from here? Here, I'll give you a hand. And then, oh. oh, but Johnny, didn't listen, you say listen to them? Uh who cares what I, they I say? I can't come down, Chuck. They want me. He, they want me to jump the crowd. You hear what they say? Johnny, take my hand. Come on, come I on, take my hand. Them, Chuck. I never cared about him before, and now I can't break away. Now, don't try to grab me. I take my hand, Johnny. Huh? I'm in their hands, Chuck. When I came out here, I put myself in their hands, in their care. Get away from me, Chuck. Get away from me. And don't fight me, Chuck. Johnny, Johnny go. go. Oh, oh. 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 He asked for your help down there. You down there in the streets. And you wanted his blood. Well, you got it. Blood. On your head. On your head. Presented Jump, Jump, written by Raphael David Blau, directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Jack Manning, Ralph Bell, Gene Gillespie, Ian Martin, and Sam Raskin. Audio engineers, Marty Folia and Bill Sandreuter. Sound technicians, Ed Blaney and M.C. Brock. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, Box 233, New York, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. For someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help 
for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. Yes, tonight the Mystery Playhouse is host to Nick and Nora Charles as they appear in another episode from The Adventures of the Thin Man. Well, to begin with, our mystery in the latter vein is chock full of surprising and unusual occurrences. Take, for instance, the fact that it's 9 o'clock in the morning when our story opens and Nick Charles, who usually can't be pried from the arms of Morpheus before noon except in case of fire or disorder, is not only up but fully dressed. And it's in this extremely unlikely situation that he's found by his good friend Ebenezer Williams, sheriff of Crabtree County. Eb is very surprised indeed. In fact, you might say he's amazed. Well, all dressed, my Godfrey. You sure you're all right, Nick? Oh, come in, Eb. I've been going crazy. I've been up all night. What's wrong? Nora's gone. She left the house yesterday afternoon. I haven't heard a word from her since. Oh, so she finally come to her senses. Did she find another fella? Eb, this is serious. I, I called the police, the newspapers. There's not a trace of her. This never happened before. Oh, take it easy, Nick. Eb, I've never felt so miserable. Well, look at me. No no dinner, no sleep, no Nora. Uh, maybe that'll learn you to be nice to your next wife. I don't want a next wife. I want the one I got. You, you can't get that model anymore. What am I saying? Eb, do uh, you, you really think she left me? Maybe. Oh, oh, maybe that's the police. Maybe they found the body. Maybe. Shall I answer it? No, I'll face it. I have it coming to me. Hello? Hello. Tell Nora that Wolfie is calling. Who are you? Wolfie, you dope. Well, I'm Nora's husband. Don't worry. You won't be for long. Oh, how do you know? Because I'm the guy she's going to marry. Who says so? She does. She proposed to me last night. Hey, what is this, a gag? What, what did you do to my wife? My dear fellow. Hey, come on, you pug talk. I refuse to listen to such language over a telephone... Hello? Hello? Who was that? Some idiot Nora promised to marry last night. That ain't possible. She can't be married to two idiots at the same time. That guy screamed just before he hung up. Eb, what could have happened to Nora? Uh, Hello? Hello? This is Leo. Hello, Leo. What do you want? Two hundred dollars, of course. What for? The mirror, naturally. Cheap. But that's Leo for you. Always a sucker for a beautiful dame. Listen, I don't know anything about this. Well, didn't your wife tell you about me? No. Oh, that's deceptive. Where'd you last see my wife? In Leo's. The gathering place of convivial spirits. She left after she broke the mirror behind my bar. Why? My wife didn't get home. I've been looking everywhere for her. Entre nous, bud. You shouldn't let a dame like that go around loose. That's just it. Was she loose? Well, I'd say she was tight. That's impossible. Nora never gets tied. Does she throw horseshoes at mares in her natural state? Where did she get a horseshoe? From a horse, naturally. Who was my wife with? One was a female lady of interesting design. The other was a male gentleman of designing interest. What are you talking about? The guy I know. His name is Bill Martin, a no good. The dame I didn't know. Listen, I'll, I'll be down to your place. Where, where is it? On 6th Avenue in the village. You know what I'd do if I had a wife like yours, bud? Oh, what? I'd lock her and me in a golden cage and throw away the key. Goodbye. Goodbye, Leo. Oh, Eb, this is the zaniest thing that ever happened. Nicky, darling. No. Oh, and Eb Williams. How are you, Ebby Webby? Fine, Nori. And how are you? Oh, are you a military secret? Uh, I'm feeling deliriously hilarious. Have you ever walked on bubbles? No, dear. It requires the greatest delicacy, and it's hard to keep your balance. Kiss me, darling. Nora, what have you been drinking? I didn't touch a drop. All I had was one teeny wee cup of tea. Tea? Mm, with crumpets. Kiss me. Where were you last night? Kiss me first. There. Now, mm. where were you last night? Oh, uh, last night? 
Well, darling, I had tea with Joan Lawrence, and then... Well, then I don't remember. Well, that's odd, isn't it? Well, don't you remember anything? Well, of course. I woke up in a nice, comfy hotel suite, and I tried to phone you, but the line was busy, so I came over, and here I am. Oh, who is... Williams nailed down that floor. Oh, get me! Laura! She's, she's out, Ed. Yeah. Well, I reckon that solves the mystery of your missing wife. No, Eb, you're wrong. I'm afraid we're at the beginning of another mystery. Huh? Look up Dr. Barton's name in the phone book. Tell him to get up here immediately. Why? Is there something wrong? Look at her eyes, Eb. Unless I'm crazy, she's been drugged. <laughs> I dying? No, dear. The doctor said you'll be okay. The doctor? Yes, Sonori. You've been drugged. Oh, why should anyone want to do a thing like that to little me? Mm, that's what I want to find out. What happened after you had tea with Joan Lawrence? I, I don't know. In your bag, we found a key to a suite in the Wilson Hotel. You remember registering there? No, but I woke up there. Where'd you go between the time you had tea with Joan and the time you woke up? I have no idea. Do you remember going to a joint called Leo's? The gathering place of convivial spirits? Mm, sounds delightful. Was I there? I reckon so. You broke the mirror behind his bar with a horseshoe. Now, what made you do a thing like that? Well, I can't imagine, Eb. But I do remember one thing. There was the nicest man with me and Joan. Wolfie? No. No, I don't remember anyone named Wolfie. Well, you should, dear. You ask him to marry you. You know, I must have had a wonderful time. Tell me more. You know a fellow named Bill Martin? That's him. He's the nicest man. Joan knew him. He's in business with her husband. Darling, did you call Joan? Yes, baby. No one answers at her apartment. Well, that's funny. Nick, do you think something happened to Joan? I don't know, darling. But I don't think you were drugged by accident. We're going to the Wilson Hotel and check that key you have. Come in, Nora. Eb? Yeah. Was this the suite you woke up in? Mm hmm. I remember. It looked a mess. Looks like a hurricane struck it. Isn't it a shame, dear? What? I evidently had the time of my life last night, and I didn't even know it. Hey, uh, Mr. Russell left his bag here. Eb, will you help me open it? Okay, baby dokey. Hey, that's sure an oversized suitcase. Looks more like a little trunk. Uh, now she's open it. <gasps> Nick! Don't be frightened, baby. He can't hurt you. He's dead. That, that's Bill Martin. He was the nicest man. The one that told you about it. We, the woman's compact in his pocket. That's my compact. I wonder how he got it. Nora, did you kill him? Me? Kill him? Yes, darling. Now, 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 don't be afraid to tell me the truth. Well, I, I don't remember. Now, just try to think. Did you stick a knife in his back because... Because he got fresh? Well, I, I don't know. You sure he was killed with a knife, Nick? Well, yeah, you can see the wound in his back. Say, there's blood stains here near the telephone. Did you find anything more on his body? Just this watch. Oh, you can't use that, Nick. It's broken. Give it back. Just a second. Nick, could that be broke like that because a bullet hit it? That's what I was wondering, Eb. The hand stopped at 5.30. No bullet holes in this guy. Nora, you keep this watch. Uh, what's the name of the restaurant where you had tea with Joan Lawrence? The Bixley on Lower Fifth Avenue. It's near Joan's apartment. I'm going down there. Do you think poor Joan is dead, too? Maybe, baby. I want you and Eb to take a careful look around here and then go to Joan's apartment. Eb, use this collection of skeleton keys to get in. So long, darling. Take good care of her, Eb. All right. Eb. Hmm? You don't think I killed him, do you? I don't know, Nori. Say, will you take a look in them closets? I'm going over that other room. Careful. All right, Eb. Oh, what a lovely closet. Oh, my neck. Find anything in that closet, Nori? Nori? Don't you hear me? 
Sorry. I just look. Look. Glory. Uh, head waiter said you wanted to have words with me. Yeah, that's right. We're you on duty in this restaurant about five o'clock yesterday afternoon? Yeah. Hey, ain't you Nick Charles? That's right. Don't you remember me? Raphael, the rat. Of course, I sent you up, didn't I? Yeah. I could have got 50 years, but you only let me get 10. Gee, you changed. You used to be a good-looking young fella. Well, I hope you've changed too, Raphael. Here, uh, will you take a look at this picture in my wallet? <whistles> Some doll. That's my wife. Did you serve her yesterday? What does the rest of her look like? The usual accessories, but well placed. She was here. With another dame. This other dame had a wonderful built. I saved him. Where? In that boot right over there. Listen, Raphael. I want you to remember exactly what happened while they were here. Try and recall every detail. If it'll help your memory, act it out. Okay. Now, uh, let me see. You be your wife. I am the girl with the built. So, we come in. We look around to see if anybody notices what terrific lookers we is. And after we see that all the wolves is foaming at the mouth, we sit down. Now, where, where do I sit? In the corner of the booth. Me. I'm the other girl. I sit here. So another person joins us. A guy named Bill. Very good looking. Bill Martin? Yeah, yeah, that's his name. He ordered cocktails. Now, listen carefully. Did you see Bill Martin put anything in the girl's tea? No. But an hour later, they was all still here. Bill had lots of drinks. And he was all laughing like things was hilarious. Did you see any of them leave? Yeah, I left. I mean me, the, uh, the girl with the pill. I comes up and asks me, Rayfield, where is the telephone booth? And I tell me. Then me, Rayfield, I see your wife and a man in the booth. How did my wife look? Tired like. Sort of sitting in the corner, leaning back with her eyes closed. I figure she drunk some of the guy's cocktails. When did this girl return? In about five minutes. Did the man leave the booth at all? No. Why should he leave when he's got a good-looking babe like your wife there? About six o'clock, they all left together. They all walked with a wobble. Okay, Raphael. I guess that'll be all. Thanks. Don't mention it. And if you need my help again, be free to call on me. Nothing's too much for the guy what set me up the river for ten years. <laughs> I will accept your check for $200, Mr. Charles. That's Leo for you. He'll take a check from anybody. You mind if I ask you a few questions, Leo? Not at all. I personally am a convivial spirit, and I like conversation. At what time did my wife break that mirror? At precisely 2 a.m. What makes you so sure? I was waiting to hear the war news. You know, they have it on the radio every hour. Bill Martin and this girl were with my wife all the time? Yeah. Why did you say Bill Martin was a no-good? Did you ever hear of Pedro Gonzalez? Sure, he used to have a bootlegging mob. It's black market now. This guy, Bill Martin, was connected with him. He tried to sell me some tax-free liquor once. Oh. Leo, can, can I use your phone? Sure, sure, go ahead. Take a tip from me, pal. Don't fool around with Gonzalez. He ain't no convivial spirit. Well, I'm just trying to find out if Martin drugged my wife. Hello? Uh, hello, Ebb. How long have you been there at Jones' place? I'm glad you called. The killer was hiding in one of the closets. D did you get him? No, the killer got us. What? He shot Nori on the head. But she's all right now. Oh, good. He sneaked outside entrance. Well, did, did you find anything important in the apartment? I reckon so. We found another corpse. Who? Joan? We, no, no. Her husband. Shot full of bullet holes. And plenty murdered. <laughs> Yeah. All right, I got you, Nick. All right, Nick, I'll do like you say. All right. Did Nick find the killer, Em? No, but he was telling me about the information he dug up. What are you doing there, Em? Just looking at this corpse's pocket, Nori. There's a bullet hole into it. I didn't notice that before. Is it important? Maybe. 
Now, that's the vest pocket where a fellow usually carries a watch. You know, I think this fellow was not only killed, he was robbed by Godfrey. Ev, did you notice that banjo clock on the wall? Well, what about it? It stopped at two. And the reason it stopped is because there are a couple of bullet holes in it. Look. Oh, Joan, darling. Hello, Nora. Oh, I've got the most awful headache. I... Gilbert! Gilbert, what happened Now, don't, to him? don't try to put this up together. Your oh, husband's been murdered. We found him here like that. Gilbert. Now, dear. Oh, Nora, this, this is awful. There, now, Nick and our friend Ed Williams are working on this case. Now, if you can keep a grip on yourself, you can help us. Well, well uh, I'll be all right, Nora. I was afraid something like this was going to happen. That's why I wanted to talk to you yesterday. My husband and Bill Martin, they were in trouble with Pedro Gonzalez. He's a gangster, you know. Yeah, Nick told me all about that. Miss Lawrence, uh, where was you last night? Well, I, uh, I'm i not really sure. It's all very hazy, I I woke up only a few minutes ago at the Royal Crest Hotel. Did did anything happen to Bill Martin? He's been murdered, too. Oh, no. Nora, he was drugged. Well, then, then I must have been drugged, too. Well, of course, I see it all now. They drugged us so I, I wouldn't go home and find them killing Gilbert. And Bill Martin must have known about it. He was very close to them, so they killed him to keep him quiet. Yeah. Was your husband alive at two yesterday afternoon? Well, yes, I... I had lunch with him. Joan, why'd you murder your husband? What are you talking about? You, Joan. You murdered both of them. No, he, he's crazy, isn't he? Eb, how could she have done it? It's impossible. No, she drugged you at about 5.15 yesterday afternoon. Then left, saying she had to make a phone call. But instead, she come up here and killed her husband. She turned the clock back to two, put a few bullets into it, come back to the restaurant where you were sitting with Bill Martin. In your condition, Nori, you didn't even know she'd been gone. I don't remember everything, but I do know Joan was with me last night. Sure. She was using you as an alibi. At 2 a.m., the time she wanted the police to believe the murder was committed, she and Bill Martin put you up to throwing that horseshoe into the mirror in back of Leo's bar. But why'd she want me to do a thing like that, Ian? To strengthen the alibi. Ain't that right, Joan? He, he's out of his head. Am I? You give Nori an extra dose of the drug. Put her to bed in the Wilson Hotel. Now, up to this point, Bill Martin was helping you. Your problem now was to get rid of Martin. I suppose I killed him, too. You told him to call Nick's place, act like a goon, and use the name Wolfie. The object was to see if Nori was home yet. Well, as soon as he finished phoning, you drove a knife into his back. Nick even heard his scream. Listen, if I'm such a clever killer, why'd they ever pick on Nora to have tea with me? Because... You knew after your husband was found dead that Nori would get Nick interested in the case. It would be simple to hint that Bill Martin got some hoodlum to do it. Martin would appear especially guilty since he was dead also. All right. Get him up, both of you. I'm getting out of here. If any of you try to follow me, you'll be killed. Goodbye. Hello. <laughs> Nicky. Oh, I just clipped her lightly on the chin, darling. Guess what? Ev solved the whole thing. She's the killer. Well, of course, baby. I knew it all along. Now, how did you figure it out? Darling, you know I never discuss such things outside our bedroom. Wait till tonight. Why can't you ever tell me how brilliant you are in broad daylight? <laughs> I'm ready and waiting for your story. Well, it was simplicity itself, baby. I knew that whoever drugged you probably committed the murder. There were only two suspects, Martin and Joan. And since Martin was dead, it had to be Joan. Right. I was afraid for a while that Joan was dead, too. I'd have to investigate Gonzalez. Joan confessed that she did it for her husband's insurance. Martin was in love with her, and so was a willing accomplice. Did you miss me last night, dear? Well... Not at all. You big liar. Eb, tell me what you said. I ought to stay away more often. It'll make you appreciate me. Better not try it, or, or I'll stay away nights, too. What about me did you miss most of all, Mickey? The way you say good night. Oh. Well, then. Good night, Mickey, darling. <laughs> Thank you.
thank you, Nick and Nora Charles, for another chapter in The Adventures of the Thin Man. Tonight's presentation in the Mystery Playhouse. Before taking our usual trip to the green room, let's discuss three ways we can all help lengthen the war. Here they are. First, throw away all your extra equipment. Second, don't take care of the equipment and ordnance you have left. Third, waste your field rations. Only eat the parts you like. Well, that's only three ways. But if each and every man and woman in the service indulged in just those three consistently, V-Day would be a far cry indeed. Of course, no, one's, no one would act like that on purpose, but unfortunately, we all tend to treat GI materiel a little bit like a stepsister. And when you multiply your callousness and wastage a million or more times, it's no longer funny. So let's not help lengthen the war. Let's shorten it by conserving everything we have. And now to the green room and a preview performance of our next Mystery Playhouse attraction. Follow me, please. Come. Why did Mr. Crabber have us all come here for a conference? I don't know, Miss Warner. It's about the theft of those, those rare books, I guess. You've been with the A.H. Dark Company for a long time, Mr. Finney. Tell me, is the bookstore in a really bad way? Well, it's pretty bad, Miss Warner. Careful, people. Here comes old Crank Crabber. Oh, Philip, oh, oh, Dark. You coming in here with me or aren't you? I'm coming, Mr. Crabber. I'm coming. Now, silence, please. All right. Just a moment, people. Mr. Crabber has something to say. Uh, as you all know, for the past few months, the A.H. Star Company has been losing rare items out of our private stock of first edition. I'm convinced those thefts are an inside job. One of you employees is the thief. Now, wait, please. I want you all to know that Mr. Clabber and I are in total disagreement on this. Personally, I trust every one of you. Well, I don't. This stealing keeps up the company will go bankrupt. So I've decided on a drastic step. As of closing time today... The entire staff of this store, every last one of you, is fired. Oh, yeah. Me too. Mr. Clabber, I've been with the A.H. Doc Company as bookkeeper for 58 years. Mr. Doc, Mr. Phil. I'm sorry, Mr. Finney, but I'm helpless. Mr. Clabber now owns 51% of the stock. That gives him full power to dictate store policy. But even if one of us is a thief, why make the rest of us suffer? I know, Miss Warner, but my hands are tied. The Clabber's arranging to have new clerks report tomorrow and a new secretary stenographer. I may as well tell you that Mr. Dark's talked me into promising that if and when the thief is caught, all you people will be rehired. Now, that's all. Back to your counter. Dark, where are you running to off such a hurry? Boston, Clabber, and I wish to heaven it was the North Pole. <laughs> Aren't you a cop anymore, Mr. Fletcher? I should say not, Miss Porter. Heck no. Fletcher's the ace investigator of the Worldwide Insurance Company now. And look at me. What for, Billy? Huh? Only you'd like Fletcher's style. He goes in for fancy deductions the way you do. Oh, a competitor, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right. Ellery, I'm on a case for Worldwide involving the A.H. Dark Company, and you can do me a favor. Me, Fletcher? I was nosing around the dark bookstore this morning and overheard one of the employees phoning you. He's due here any minute. <laughs> yes, the clerk there named Miss Warner. But how could Ellery do you a favor, Mr. Fletcher? No one down at Dark's knows who I am, and it's better if they don't find out I'm an insurance company detective. How about introducing me to this Warner woman as your associate? Let me sit in. I'll go. That must be Miss Warner now. Queen, what do you say? Well, of course, I'd be glad to. Really, let's you and me duck into the other room. Too many of us might scare the woman out. Here, you'd scare her hot sock. Ellery, this is Miss Warner of the A.H. Dark Company. How do you do? How do you do? And I've brought along Mr. Finney, the bookkeeper. Uh, sit down, please. Uh, meet Mr. Fletcher, my assistant. How do you do? How do you do? What can I do for you? You start, Mr. Finney. Well, Mr. Queen, young Mr. Philip Dark doesn't know much about the rare book business, and, well, the firm's in pretty bad shape. So some time ago, Mr. Dark was forced to take in a partner, Mr. Clabber, who uh, knew rare books and had capital, too. Adolf Clabber. Adolf Clabber is one of the leading rare book experts of America, Queen. I've heard of him, Fletch. Uh, well, sir, Mr. Clabber started printing uh, special editions of classics limited to one copy for wealthy collectors. Editions of one copy? That's really limited. Yes, miss. 
Mr. Crabber does all the work by hand himself. His private press and bindery in his Long Island home. Mr. Finney, the point is business didn't improve much. And then valuable old first began to disappear from the store. The insurance company hasn't found the thief yet. And now Mr. crabber has gone and fired everyone in the store. What? That's terrible, Miss Warner. Even me. Fifty-eight years with the store. But Mr. Clabber will take us all back when the thief is caught. So, Mr. Queen, will you find the thief? And get our jobs back. Oh, well, that's an appeal I can't resist. Yes, I will. Oh, thank uh, you, Mr. Thank Queen. You. Now, do you know anything about the theft? Well, I don't, Mr. Queen, but Mr. Finney here does. That's one reason I brought Mr. Finney along. You know something, Finney? What? Well, I, I, I can't tell you, Miss Warner. I told you I couldn't tell anyone yet. Well, I can't understand you, Mr. Finney. You must tell about your discovery. You made a discovery, Mr. Finney? Yes, but, but it's a secret, a terrible secret. So terrible, I, I can't disclose it to, to anyone. Well, uh, can't you even give us a hint, Mr. Finney? Well, it would ruin Doc's, maybe the, the whole rare book business. That's all I can say, uh, Mr. Queen. Please don't ask me anymore. If we discover the thief, will you tell us? Maybe, sir. Maybe. Uh... Does either Clabber or Doc know you two have come to Mr. Queen for help? Oh, no, Mr. Fletcher. Old Clabber is not a man to ask anyone for help. And Mr. Doc, well, he's nice, but sort of scatterbrained. Full of fun, loves parties, and keeps practicing magic tricks like a stage magician. No sense of responsibility at all. Well, we'll look into it. Uh, Nikki, will you see Miss Warner and Mr. Finney out? Yes, Miss Queen. You'll hear from us. Okay. Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, Fletcher... Do you know the secret old Finney's so upset about? No, I don't. Peter and I overheard the whole thing. Secrets. Hey, Maestro, you mean to say you're going to take a case Fletch is already investigating? <laughs> if Fletch doesn't mind. Why should I mind, Queen? Go do it. Well, thanks a lot. I've got to run. Bye, you two mugs. So All right. Bye. 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 Where's Fletch going in such a rush? <laughs> I have to get a head start in Hillary. You better get busy, Maestro. Fletch's tough competition and rare books are his rack. Oh, wonderful. You'll find he's in a contest. Nikki, come on. You and I are going to investigate this case from the inside. We're going to become bookstore clerks. Well, there's the beginning of our next Mystery Playhouse production, featuring the master detective, Ellery Queen. Ellery temporarily goes into the rare book business to get at the bottom of a peculiarly intriguing mystery, which you and our audience, of course, are invited to have a go at, too. So come with your thinking caps on next time as Ellery Queen turns his attention to the adventure of the dark secret. This is Sergeant X, closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. What goes on in the mind of a murderous killer? What is it about some people that lead them to commit murder? Is there something that is different or is it simply a switch that gets turned on? Murderous Minds – Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escaped the Headlines offers a look into the lives of individuals who didn't just become killers but who managed to avoid the media storm that usually accompanies them. Inside, you will hear about people like Sante Kimes, a 65-year-old mother who was driven by greed and who committed multiple murders with her son. Robert James Ackerman, 
the MBA graduate who murdered three people in order to continue getting lap dances from a stripper that he became infatuated with. Larry Jean Ashbrook, who became deluded into thinking that strangers were accusing him of murder. When he could not take it anymore, he carried out a massacre at the Wedgwood Baptist Church. And more. Each story harbors its own distinct narrative and reasoning for the perpetrators of these heinous crimes, along with the background to the case, their lives, and the aftermath of their actions. Sometimes the truth is more appalling than anything fiction can provide, and Murderous Minds proves it once again. Murderous Minds, Volume 1, Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escaped the Headlines by Ryan Becker, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample or purchase the title on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. fiction from the years beyond 2000 A.D. Today, the story of a horrible nightmare that wouldn't stop even when the dreamer woke up. A story called A Green Thing. the year 2000 plus 175. It is late evening, and all is peaceful and quiet in Dr. Harvey Glendon's sanitarium. Outside, on a vast estate that stretches away from the main building, there are only the soft country noises, the wind sighing in the trees, the shrill chirpings of innumerable crickets. In the well-furnished rooms, the patients sleep stretched out on comfortable mattresses and clean white sheets, the country breezes straying over their forms. In room 32B, Mr. Summers sleeps peacefully with his head on a fluffy pillow. He sleeps and he dreams. Help me! Help me! the growing psychological problems facing our nation, the government has sent me to you, Dr. Glendon, to enlist your aid. Since you're the country's outstanding psychiatrist... Well, I'm honored indeed, Mr. Carley. But I don't know that there's much I can tell you about the advancement of psychiatric research that isn't being published in the medical journals. Well, Dr. Glendon, isn't there anything that you're working on now, something definite? I know you're a cautious scholar, but... Uh... Look, Mr. Carling, it isn't possible to announce sweeping new generalizations in our kind of science. Our work is painstaking, complex, highly subjective. You take the case of one of the patients here in the sanitarium. Oh, Betty, will you bring our records of Mr. Summers? Oh, yes, Dr. Glennon, just one moment. Summers is about 40, 41. He was admitted five months ago, suffering from a melancholia. Here are the records, Doctor. Oh, thanks, Betty. Now, as you can see from these notations, he's been feeling much better the past few weeks. Mm-hmm. Yes, 
I see. Until last night, when he suddenly woke up screaming in his bed. He was being attacked, he shouted, by some sort of green devil. We had the hardest job getting him under control. Now, in the past, Summers had spoken quite often of a green hat that he lost as a child. His father, he remembered, had punished him severely for losing it. In later life... Mr. Glendon, this is all very interesting, but you can hardly call this dream analysis anything new. Yes, it has been known for centuries. Well, then I don't understand... Mr. Carling, I know why you came to see me. Apparently, I haven't been able to keep my achievement as secret as I'd hoped. That's right, sir. We've heard rumors. All right, Mr. Carling. I've said that Mr. Summer's dream is very unusual. Now, would you like to see it? You mean, see his dream? Exactly. I'm going to show you a motion picture of Mr. Summer's dream. Photographed from the subconscious mind, exactly as he dreamed it. I attach special nerve electrodes, and these electrodes pick up the current impulses of the brain. Then these impulses are transmuted back into pictures on the film of the machine, really very similar to the method of wireless photography. Here's Mr. Summers' dream reel, Doctor. Oh, fine. Thank you, Eddie. The projector tube is ready, so I just place the dream reel in it, and uh, there. Hold on to your hat, Mr. Carling. You're going to see an actual dream. Yes, yes, very well, Mr. Clobber. Three slices of lemon drops will do. He thinks I don't see him putting the pennies in his pocket when he knows they belong to me. Three slices of lemon drops it is, little boy. I'm not a little boy, Clobber, and you know it. I'm all grown up, and I don't come to your store anymore. I don't even live here anymore, and you steal pennies. All right, all right. Get out, my little boy. Take your lemon drops and get out. Get out. Music. I didn't know Clobber had music in his store. I don't like his music. I'll slam his door. I'll go out in the street. Now there won't be any more penny-stealing music. Oh, what's that? It won't go away. It won't go away. Summers, I am calling you. What's that? It's not Clover. It's... It's green. It's a monster with great pink eyes on long stalks. It's standing in front of me. It has claws. You're not the little boy anymore, Summers. Oh, no, no, don't touch me with your claws. Come with me now, Summers. You are mine. You belong to me. No, no, no. You're touching me. Don't. Don't. Don't help me. Help me, please. <laughs> Betty got to him at that moment, and the dream machine shut off. Phew. Some dream. Uh, what effect will the discovery of this dream machine have on psychiatric research, Dr. Glendon? Well, I've only just perfected it about four or five months ago. We've got perhaps 40 or 50 photographed dreams in our files. 40 or 50? Yeah. However, as far as developing new techniques and treatment, maybe years before I can get them analyzed and correlated so that overall theories can be drawn from them. As long as that. So now you understand, Mr. Carling, why it's a little difficult for me to answer your questions. That dream was fascinating. I've never seen anything like it. A uh, Doctor, I know I'm presuming on your time, but I'd like to see just one more. I'll have to report on these at the government bureau. Well, only one more, though. I'm sorry, but I'm quite busy. Uh, what about this one here? The purple tag. What's that for? Well, I haven't seen that one myself yet. Purple tag means it's from the violent ward. Mr. Rolfe. Hmm. Sick man. Well, we'll try it. That. Green white mice. How do you do, Mrs. Kemp? <laughs> For I'm climbing a wall and there's only two of us. It's <laughs> now one. Me. Me. I'm all alone. <laughs> Don't take that balloon. Doesn't <laughs> make much sense of that. Gibberish, I'm afraid. Ralph's a difficult case. Homicidal tendencies. Comes from a good family. Was a very successful businessman. Huh. Can you 
you do anything for him? Oh, I think so. There are times when he can be reached, lucid moments, and some of his dreams provide clues. There, see? Now, 74, that'll show him. Screen. Look, there it is again. That green thing. No. It can't be. It's impossible. Two people can't possibly have the same dream. I don't understand it, Betty. I can't understand it. I've been through all the records of both of them, Summers and Rolf. There's nothing in that background that would cause them to have the same dream. Are you sure they haven't been together at some time? I'm positive, Doctor. They haven't even met. Mr. Roth came here only a month ago, and he was placed in a violent ward immediately. He's never been out of it. It's possible for people to have similar dreams, yes, but never to dream of the same unusual, horrible, specific subject as that, that green thing. Every detail was the same. The pink eyes, the claws. Makes me shudder myself. Betty, I want our dream reels. All those I haven't seen. Oh, now, you're not going to view them all. It would take you... I don't care how long it takes. I want to see them all. I've got a funny feeling inside. And I won't be at ease until I know. Until I'm sure. Sure of what, Dr. Grandin? Sure that none of the other patients have had that dream. That same horrible dream of... of that green thing. Dream nine, Mrs. Jordan. Shall I put the sound on? Oh, no, not necessary. We can see it if it appears. No, nothing here. Dream 10, Miss Farnham. No, nothing. I don't think we'll find anything, Doctor. It must have been a freak, a coincidence. Uh, keep going, keep going. Dream 11, Mr. Craig. <laughs> Dream 21. Nothing there, either. Dream 22. Huh. Maybe you're right, Betty. I'm beginning to think myself... Dr. Glendon! Dr. Glendon, look! There it is! A green thing! Dream 42, Mr. Bradley. Turn off the sound. Turn it off. That's it again. A green thing. Four of them, Carly. Four dreams of that monstrous green thing. Each one from a different patient. And each one during the past week. Darling, there's something there. Something to make even a psychiatrist feel frightened. <laughs> Darling, the patients weren't having a dream. They couldn't be. They had nothing in common but the fact that they're in this sanitarium. Why, even the nature of their illnesses are different. Doctor, aren't you getting a little mixed up yourself? Huh? You saw those dreams. I saw them. Betty saw them. I know it's incredible, Listen, but... to have a dream means that you create that dream. You and nobody else. You mean you think the patients didn't create those dreams? They're not their dreams? There is such a thing as thought projection. Mental telepathy? Yeah. Why should anyone want Someone to... Someone may have found out about the dream machine. Maybe jealousy or grudge or a hatred of psychiatry in general. There are many reasons. Well, what we've got to do is to find out where it's coming from. The patients must be protected. How? First, we've got to find out whether this telepathy is coming from inside or outside the sanitarium. Then we've got to track it down. I tell you, Carly... Whoever's trying this terror by mental telepathy isn't going to get away with it. I'm not going to stand by while a lifetime's work is destroyed by a campaign of terror against my patients. I'm going to institute protective measures at once. Anything yet, Doctor? Oh, I still have the guard screen beamed on the area directly around the main building. I don't expect to find anything so close, but I want to search every inch of the grounds. You still feel whoever it is is on the ground. Can't be sure of anything. 
except that I'm convinced that the staff is loyal, and I have a hunch that whoever is transmitting these thought waves will want to be close enough to judge the results. Shall I bring the patients down now, Dr. Glendon? Oh, yes, Betty. Go get them, will you please? It's just possible that they may be able to help us. They may have felt currents emanating from a certain direction. Mm. I think the goddess screen has reached its range limit, Doctor. It's repeating itself. Mm. All right, I'll give it wider focus. I'm going into the grounds now. Wait, there's something. A figure on the screen. Yeah, I see him. He's carrying a club, a stick or something. Who is it, Doctor? Can you tell? I don't want to alarm him. I'll signal the patrol corps. Let me. That red button on the wall, isn't it? Oh, no, no calling. Never mind. That is one of the patrol corps. I can see his armband. Oh. Too bad. Well, I'll switch the machine to the north fringe. There's another figure. Is that... It isn't... <laughs> we seem to be well guarded. Another member of the patrol corps. Well, let's hope the patients will be able to... Here's help. Betty. Doctor. Doctor. She's alone. Betty, where are the patients? They're gone, Doctor. What? They disappeared. And a fifth patient has just begun screaming in his room, the green thing, the green thing. Sixty-four, all accounted for, Doctor. The four that are missing would make sixty-eight. That's how many patients we have. I checked the nurses, eight besides Betty. And they're all here. And the patrol corps have checked the rest of the staff. And no one has left the grounds except the four patients. Unless somebody got in and carried them off. No, no. No jet mobiles and no jet ships have been in the vicinity between the time the patients were last reported and now. The patrol corps will vouch for that. There's the village. Linfield? Oh, it's the only village for a hundred miles. But it's a backwoods country village. A quaint place. Never kept up with the times. Now, I doubt that they have any jet mobiles in Linfield, much less jet ships. But you can't arrange for transportation there, can't you? The inn. Why, that's where they go. Why didn't I think of that before? It's the center of the village, the gossip spot. If the patients entered town at all, news of them would spread to the inn. Better you take charge here. Carling and I are going to Linfield. How long will you be gone, Doctor? Until we find them. Or learn they're no longer alive. I can't help you none, Doctor. I ain't seen no strangers, spoke to no strangers, or you heard of no strangers. Well, how about transportation, jet mobiles, or jet ships? You ain't put in any calls for jet mobile service nigh on to uh, two months. Not since Miss Jennings busted her leg and we had to send her to the hospital in the city. Oh. <laughs> jet ships? Why, last time one of them flaming monsters landed here, we nearly had a riot in Linfield. Then fools all thought was invasion from Mars. Just around a wild goose chase, Doctor. Yeah, so it seems. Well, thanks anyhow, Mr. Barker. You've been very helpful. <laughs> Horse, he says. The plastic idiot believes in horse. <laughs> I do, I do. Everyone knows there's ghosts everywhere. Idiot, there's no such thing as gold. There are ghosts. There are ghosts in every village and town. Quiet down, you boys. You'll be getting my end a bad reputation hey, off. Hey, 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 there's the doctor. Dr. Glendon talking to Mr. Barker. I put it up to him now. What'd you say, Doc? There's no such thing as haunts, ghosts, either now. Hey, you, you tell my ignorant friend. Well, I wasn't listening very carefully. But if it's ghosts you're talking about... Well, there's never been any scientific evidence that they exist. Haunts don't exist. That's what you're trying to say, ain't it, Doc? Now, that's right. Well, oh, come on, Carling. Let's get out of here. Hey, hey, no ghosts. This, this Doc's an educated man. He knows. <laughs> yeah. Then suppose you tell me what that green thing was floating around down near the caves. And we ain't the only one who's seen it. Right, boys? A green thing? Where? What are these caves? Right down to river. Why, Doc? You ain't going there. It's nighttime now. Carling, no, 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 no. will you risk it? I've got my right gun. But, Doc, you're crazy. I'm telling you, there's a haunt. Why, there ain't a man in this whole village go with you tonight. Well, if it's only a ghost, you needn't worry. But if we're not out of those caves by dawn, you better come for us. 
It won't be a ghost that's holding us. This must be the right cave, Carling. It's the only one with a brush trampled down in front of it. Here is a tomb in here. Shh, quiet, quiet. I don't hear anything. Well, they just don't want to be taken by surprise. Have to be as quiet as possible. All right, come on. Hey, what's that? Carling, where are you? Carling, are you all right? Oh, it's coming for me. That green thing, the green thing, it's gone. It's there. No, 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 there's nothing there. You're on the floor of the cave, but there's no one near you. Nothing. Snap out of it, Carling. It's only a dream. Only a dream. It's coming. It's coming. I feel dizzy. Tired. What's the matter with me? I'm falling asleep. Oh, I won't. I won't hurt myself. Dr. Glendon. Dr. Glendon. The green thing. Did you? Did you conquer me, Dr. Glendon? I can't be. Standing over me. The pink eyes and long stalks. Your claws. The green thing. Summers, go on. Now, what have you done to him? Summers, are you all right? Bradley. Bradley, this is Dr. Glendon, your, your doctor. What's the matter with him? Gardner. Bradley. Nothing is the matter with them. They just don't understand you anymore. They are attuned only to Venusian thought waves. Venusians? You're from the planet M Venus? That is right. For a long time, we have been observing your Earth, your resources, and your remarkable technology. But we did not know how to conquer you, for we of Venus have no strength for physical dexterity. Only mental power. You shouldn't have told me that. I'm going to beat that horrible body of yours to a pulpy great mess. <laughs> you hit only air, didn't you? <laughs> I'm growing tired of this game. Stop. I will that your arms obey me and not you. I, I can't move them. God, you hurt me. Do not be foolish again, and I will return their motion. <sighs> you hypnotized my patients the same way, didn't you? Are those dreams... A little more complicated than what you earthlings call hypnosis. But it is mind control. 
I have come to Earth to prove to my planet that this is the way to conquer your Earth. We will control the minds of its inhabitants and thereby control their strength, their physical dexterity. I began on your patience first because their minds are more easily controlled. What do you want of them? Their bodies. They can perform physical acts that I cannot. With their bodies, we Venusians can continue our investigation of your planet at close range. And we can also study the structure of the Earthling when I bring them back with me. Bring them back? To Venus? Do not worry, my dear doctor. I shall not separate them from you. I will also take you and your companion with me to Venus as rare prizes. <laughs> Earthling, bind these two men. No. no, don't do it, man. I'm your friend, your doctor. No, let me go. Let me go. Oh, you shot him. You shot the monster. Forgot about me. Maybe he didn't know the Earthlings had weapons, too, like ray guns. Well, why doesn't he fall? He's still standing. Did you really think you could hurt me with that? Your death rays have no effect on my body. Drop your weapon. Find the men. I'll shoot them. I'll kill you, slave. But... You cannot. But if you could, I would not care. There are millions more to choose from. You can kill yourselves, too. You are replaceable, except to yourselves. You are trapped. Your only escape is death. Oh, the crumbling. The explosion of your ray gun, Carling. You've loosened the rocks. It's a cave-in. We'll be buried alive. The corridor, quick. To the corridor. Grab the patience before the green thing controls us again. It's our only chance! There. There's the mouth of the cave. Hurry, Doctor. It's blocked. The rocks have fallen here, too. There's one big one just at the mouth. If we can move that one, I think we can make it. All right, help me, Doctor. I'll get the patients, too. All right, come on, then. Here. Now we can squeeze through now. You go first, Doctor. Pull the patients after you. All right. All right, All right I'm out. Now, Rolf, come on. That's it. All right, Bradley, you next. Come on. That's the way. All right, you, Summers. All right, Doctor. Quick, now, come on. All right, Gardner, quick. You? All right. That's... It's right there. All right, now you, Carling. I can make it. Help. Good. Help me. Earthlings. I cannot escape. Tim, he can't squeeze through. He has no physical strength. Earthlings. Earthlings. Come to me. Patience. They're going to him. He still has power over him. Come on, Colin, quick. Before they release him, help me shove this rock over the opening. Quick. Quick. That's it. No. No. There it goes. Thank goodness. Hey, what's that? Look out, step back! <laughs> Our cave fell in. We were just in time. Yes, Carling. In time to save Earth from the horror of agreeing things. Next week. 
incredible story about a man of science who dared tamper with the secret of human life. Be sure to listen to That Which Lived in a Head of Steel. 2000 Plus is produced by Dreyer and Winolson Productions Incorporated. In today's cast, Lon Clark played Lyndon, Joseph Julian was calling, Hester Sondergaard was Miss Connors, Gilbert Mack was Rolf, John Griggs was Sellers, and Henry Norell was the green thing. The script was written by Edgar Marvin. The music was composed by Elliot Jacoby, the orchestra conducted by Emerson Buckley. Sound, Walt Shaver, and Adrian Penner. Engineer, Bob Albrecht. This is Ken Martin. <laughs> Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. From Hollywood, Barry Sullivan in... Unexpected. The unexpected. The unexpected. Life is filled with the unexpected, romantic, tragic, and mysterious endings to our most ordinary actions. Dreams come true, or dreams are shattered by sudden twists of fate in The Unexpected. But first, a word from your announcer. And now, Barry Sullivan, famous motion picture and stage star in Fool Silver, a drama of the unexpected. I shaded my eyes from the sun and looked hard to make sure it wasn't a mirage. Little spirals of dust obscured my view and the streets glistened in the bright sunlight. And the metropolis of Peerless, Nevada, was real enough. Yet there was something wrong with what I saw. I felt it. I knew it. But I couldn't put my finger on it. And then it hit me. There wasn't anyone in sight. Not a soul on the streets or in the houses. The whole town was deserted and dead. Hello? 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 Anybody around here? Around here? Hello? Hello? Only echoes answered me, rising and falling through the chinks in the ramshackle buildings like the wail of a lonesome coyote. My flesh began to crawl. This was a ghost town. Then I shrugged. I didn't have time to stand around seeing spirits. I had a heavy date with a roulette wheel in Vegas, and she was a jealous mistress. I picked up a water pail and lugged it toward the deserted saloon. I figured there might be enough watered whiskey left to keep my radiator perking for at least a few more miles. I took a couple of steps inside and stopped as if I'd been hit by a slug from a 45. Sitting at the long, splintered bar was the village ghost. And quite a vision she was, too. All decked out for haunting. Black high-heeled shoes, black stockings, black shorts and halter, and a mass of black hair. But her skin, her skin was creamy, and so was her voice. Good afternoon. Yeah, very good. Looking for something? Not now. Then you won't mind leaving, the same way you came. Oh, I'd mind very much. I like the idea of this town, and I'd like to be haunted. I said get out, mister. I didn't hear you. Phantoms can't talk. Suppose we pretend that I'm real. Oh, no, I'm too young to have my illusions destroyed. But I am real. 
If you pinch me, I scream. Yeah? And if I say get out, I mean it. What's the hurry? We don't like strangers. We? I... I mean the town doesn't like them. It resents the present. It prefers the past. You're too contemporary. Well, maybe you know what you're talking about. Oh, I do. Ghosts are very particular. They won't associate with just anyone. And you? I feel exactly the same way. But... Get uh, out of here before something happens. The town and I might hasten your departure. You're doing your best. We have your interests at heart. I should say there was something very odd going on around here. I should say that you shouldn't get involved in it. You could be right. I am. Very right. So, it was nice to have met you. Sorry you can't stay, and good afternoon. She waved a shiny little revolver in my direction, so I made a deep curtsy, backed out the swinging door, and headed up the trail, the empty water bucket banging against my knees. I'd got about a hundred yards past the town limits when I met the other ghost of Peerless, Nevada. He shot a parchment-skinned, white-headed face out from behind a mesquite bush and flagged me to a stop with a heavy gray beard. Where are you heading, mister? Why, uh, uh, nowhere in particular. Well, that's good. I wouldn't like to think you was looking for me. Oh, no, no. I often wander through abandoned towns in search of buried treasure. Oh, so you did come to spy on me, huh? Come to learn my secret. Well, young fella, it won't work. Because I'm too smart for you. Indeed? Yeah, it's just like them. As soon as I made a strike, they're all ready to cash in on my claim. They laughed at me for 20 years. They wouldn't give me a nickel's worth of help. Now the vultures come swooping down. As I stood there, the old boy suddenly motioned to me to wait and dropped from sight behind the bush like a gopher ducking a lawnmower. I didn't know what was going on in Peerless. But from the fear in the old codger's eyes, it must be mighty important to somebody. And then I got it. Silver. These mountains were full of it. Maybe Grandpa had found something. That was why the delicately garbed young lady in the saloon had been so anxious for me to leave. Yeah, but I had a notion I might enjoy sticking around. For more reasons than one. Now then, young fella. You think you found me out. But you ain't. You don't know where the stuff is. No, I don't. And they won't believe I've struck it. Won't they? No, sir. They'll insist on proof, and you ain't got it. Unless... Unless what? Unless I give you this. Then they'll know it's true. Oh, uh, well. What is it? Don't use your eyes, young fellow. What does that look like? Well, it looks like silver. <laughs> That's just what it is. That's silver. It's mighty close to the pure stuff, too. What do you think of that? My acquaintance with silver was limited to tea sets, dimes, baby spoons, and wedding presents. But the gray, shapeless lump which the old miner handed me looked like the real thing. So I dropped the sneer off my lips and asked a couple of questions. You say you found a whole lot of this? Listen, young fella, I, I've been prospecting for over 60 years, and I ain't never seen a strike quite so rich. Really? But uh, the only thing is, you see, I can't get much of it out by myself. Ain't got no money to buy this newfangled equipment. Now, if I was to take on a partner... Well, uh, how much do you need? Oh, I need two, three hundred dollars. Now, if you was willing to switch over and work with me instead of again me... Why not? Why, why, sure, you was not never cut out to be a spy anyway. You look too honest. <laughs> my face is my fortune. Yes, sir. Now, now, here, you can help me in the mine, and we'll split 50-50. That's hmm? a deal. Yes, sir, young fellow, who'll hire him will make you a rich man. Well, uh, come on, come on, don't just stand there. We got work to do. As I followed Hiram through the hollow caves of the old mine, I did some fast mental gymnastics. I'd work with him, like he said. Only when the time came to sell the ore, I'd just collect the fee for myself. Then I'd stake out a legal claim to the old peerless setup in my own name. Hiram could take his mule and go prospecting somewhere else. And I'd make a quick change from gentleman gambler to millionaire. I spent the whole next week underground, except for a short trip to Virginia City for new equipment. 
By day, I hacked at the rock wall till my hands were covered with calluses. By night, I loaded ore into the old mine cars to bring them to the surface. And day and night, I listened to Hiram jabber about the time when Peerless was a boom town. Finally, I couldn't stand it any longer. I scrambled up to the surface and walked right into the unwilling arms of the lady in black, only this time, she was all in white. With Hiram. Well, how would I know? Look, mister, I'm tired of playing hide-and-seek. I'll take care of him. Yeah, I'll bet you could. He's an old man. He's harmless. He's lived here all his life. And neither you nor anybody else is going to bother him. I mean it. Well, now, look, lady, I... Grandfather's a little strange. He... he thinks he's found silver in this old mine. So he prospects around and digs a little. He's not hurting anybody. I come out every week and see that he's all right. Now, you just run back home and peddle your papers. I'll take care of Hiram. Say, are you trying to tell me that the old guy is... I told you, he, he's just a, a little odd. Yeah, but the, the silver... He didn't talk you into believing that, did he? Oh, no. No, of course not. Only the stuff he digs up. What is it? Lead ore. You know, they call it fool silver. Very low grade, practically worthless. Lead ore. Sure. Well, you can tell at a glance. But I let Hiram think it's silver. Keeps him happier that way. Of course, nobody would ever be foolish enough to believe that he really had made a strike. Now, would they? No, no. Nobody could be that foolish. Nobody in the whole wide world. You think the story is over, don't you? But wait. Fate takes a hand. Wait for the unexpected. And now for the surprising conclusion of Fool Silver, starring Barry Sullivan, a Hamilton Whitney production written by Robert Libet and Frank Burt and directed by Frank K. Danzig. <laughs> Well, I'd played a long shot and lost. It had happened before. But I didn't like the way Hiram's granddaughter smirked at me as she drew the picture. So I bade her a sad farewell, jumped in my car, and sped into the setting sun. It took me several weeks to recover my self-respect and a few legitimate games of blackjack to restore my depleted finances. And then, except for the disappearing calluses on my hands... I was able to forget all about the adventure of the peerless silver mine. But that was before I walked into Vegas' biggest hotel and saw Hiram sitting in the lobby. His hair was cut, his beard was trimmed, and a new diamond stick pin glistened in his tie. Well, hello there, young fella. It's mighty nice to see you again. Hiram, I thought... Your granddaughter said that... You thought I was crazy. Well, son, they all did, but I showed them. They're singing a different tune. You mean the... Peerless did have silver, that it wasn't lead? No, no, it, it was lead, all right. It was lead. But something else was in it, too. Something awful valuable. Oh, it's too bad you didn't stick it out. We'd have been partners. Government gave me an awful lot of money for that mine. They, you know, they said that lead was full of uh, your, your... You don't mean uranium, do you? Yeah, that's it. Uranium. Uranium. <laughs> Full Silver starred Barry Sullivan. Listen soon for another of your favorite motion picture stars in a drama of The Unexpected. <laughs> This program was transcribed in Hollywood. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, 
hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. When Salem Roanoke took a job near his family's new home as a hired hand in the Texas Hill Country, he anticipated learning the rancher's trade, but a series of strange events, shocking murders, and unholy revelations divert him down another path. This terrifying trajectory puts him directly into the middle of a struggle between monsters, magic, and men. Armed and backed by a militia of ranchers, Salem attempts to combat the creeping tide of evil that threatens to engulf his new home and destroy the people most important to him. Will Salem manage to save his home, or have his actions condemn everyone he hopes to save? The Witch Trials – A Summer of Wolves and Season of the Witch by S. R. Roanoke Available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook versions. Look for The Witch Trials by S. R. Roanoke on Amazon or find it on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. Tonight we invite you to listen to Dark Venture. Tonight's Venture in the Dark stars William Conrad in Hideout. I just talked to the doc, Sam. Yeah? And what did he tell you, Inspector? Did he tell you to come in here and hold my hand? He told me you were dying. <laughs> Smart fellow, that doc. Education is a wonderful thing. How about telling me what happened? Sure, why not? At least you'll be company. Too bad I can't offer you a shot. <laughs> Take it easy, kid. Look, don't act like a professional mourner crying your eyes out at four bits an hour. I don't feel so bad about dying as I thought. At least I'm fooling the old lady with the cards. Yeah, that time with a lady. That was the second time cards really were important in my life. First time was that night of the big poker game. Till that night, I was just another ten horn floating around town, always ready to latch onto a quick buck. Matter of fact, I was leaving my room to go downstairs and buy a dope sheet for the next day's races when the phone started ringing. Yeah? Sam, this is Phil Collins. Oh, yeah, Mr. Collins. Look. Why, sure. Why not? Come on over to room 612 at the Palace Hotel. I'm having a little poker game. Well, I'm afraid you got the wrong guy. I, I don't have the money to play in your league, Mr. Collins. You said anything about playing. We need a boy to run out for sandwiches and keep his eye open for cops. You want the job? Okay. Get over here right away. And, uh, say, just in case, you better bring a gun. I could use the dough all right, but the main reason I went was to watch one of Phil Collins' famous poker games. They were the talk of the whole town. Most of the big-shot gamblers and politicians played. There was nothing for 50,000 bucks to change hands in one night. There were three other players besides Collins, but one of them, Mike Barnes, the political big-shot, had a run of tough luck. And around midnight, he left to go across town to his apartment for more money. The three others just sat there with nothing to do. Uh, Sam... Yeah, Mr. Collins? Look, we can't play with three hands. How about you sitting in till Mike gets back? Oh, I, I only got uh, 40 bucks to my name. All right, so we'll cut the stakes down to a five-buck limit. Okay, boys? Yeah. We don't want to sit here like dopes. Come on, sit down. Well, I, I, I don't know. 40 bucks don't mean nothing to you guys, but to me... Sit down. We'll give you back what you lose. <laughs> So I sat down, me with 40 bucks and these other guys with maybe 90 grand in front of them. My collar felt tight and I couldn't breathe so good. And when Phil dealt out the cards, my fingers started shaking. What's the matter, Sam? Still worried about that 40 bucks? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I hit a streak of crazy luck. Three straight hands I won. 
By the time Mike Barnes came back, I had 300 bucks in front of me. Ah, uh, sit down, Mike. Sam was just keeping your seat warm. Okay, Sam, now fold all that big money up nice and go back to the door. Look, uh, there's room at the table for another hand. Uh, how about letting me play a while longer? I, I feel kind of lucky. You look kind of sick. <laughs> go on back to the door, Sam. Ain't that just like a tin horn? Makes a couple of bucks and figures he's going to clean us up. A funk like this needs a lift. Oh, no, you guys got me wrong. Let's I didn't... make room for it. Huh? Sure. Let's see how long that 300 bucks will last. My deal. Oh, and Sam, uh, we go back to no limit. Okay. And Sam, uh, wipe the sweat off your hands. You'll get the cards all wet. After that, I won five hands in a row. Every card I drew was right. Every bet I made was right. In three hours, I won more than 20,000 bucks. And one night, my whole life was changing. I didn't even think about the cards anymore. I was kind of imagining how things were going to be from now on. And then, right while I was dreaming about all the swell things that were going to happen to me, that good little fairy that had been waving that wand over my head must have got a little sleepy and turned in. What have you got, Sam? Two pair? Hmm. Not good enough. Three jacks. Well, that's more like it. And just like that, my luck changed. One minute sitting on top of the world, and the next minute sliding down the chute. Jack, high straight. I'm Sam. Three deuces. My part. What happened to your luck, Sammy? In the first half hour, I lost 7,000 bucks. In the second half hour, I started betting crazy, trying to win back the 7,000. And I lost 10,000 more. Quit. Quit while you're still a few thousand ahead. I kept telling myself that over and over again, but I couldn't quit. And by 3 o'clock in the morning, I was flat busted. Well, Sammy, what happened to all that dough? You saw what happened to you it. You should have just watched the door like we told you. <laughs> <laughs> shut up, shut up. Hey, hey, slow down. What's so funny? You weren't laughing a couple of hours ago. I told you to slow down. I know I saw. You didn't keep your promise, though. What do you mean? You said if he lost his 40 bucks, you'd give it back to him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I did it then. <laughs> <laughs> and listening to him laugh, looking at the fat, ugly faces, something happened to me. It was like someone pulling a switch in my brain. I felt all the blood rush into my head. Without even thinking about it, I took the gun I brought along. Hey, what are you doing with that gun? I'm taking the money I won. You what? Sit where you are, all of you. Mm. And I'm taking this dough. Yeah, it's mine, mine. Mike, I told you to sit where you are. You're not taking that money. Look, I'm telling you. I'm taking the gun away from you. And then I'm going to kick your teeth. I tell you, stay where you are. All right, then. <laughs> now, does anyone else want to stop me? No. Take the money and start running. But while you're running, keep remembering who you just shot. Mike Barnes. One of the biggest guys in this town. Yeah, start running. But don't take any bets on how far you'll get. Yeah, I started running all right. In half an hour, I was on a plane headed for Chicago. I went out to the south side and looked up an old friend, Dave Jordan. Dave ran a little rooming house on 35th Street where a guy could bury himself and no questions asked. Dave remembered me the second he opened the door. Sam Gordon, come on in. See by the papers, you're famous. Yeah. You, you got a room, Dave? I think so. But the rent's pretty high. How high? A hundred bucks a day, and you share the bed. I didn't stick my nose out of that room for a month. But after a while, it started getting me, being cooped up all the time. And... Three nights ago, I, I just couldn't take it anymore. I decided it was all right to go for a little walk. I walked around for maybe half an hour, just breathing in the fresh air. I'd left my money back in the room just to make sure that I wouldn't weaken and go in some bar. And then, on my way back, I saw this little side street carnival, and I couldn't resist going over to it and walking down the little midway. It was almost midnight, and there weren't many people around, but it sure felt good just seeing the lights again. 
Huh? Oh, no, thanks. Oh, well, look at the prices you can win. I got some dandies. No, I ain't interested. It would be if it came over. What? What do you want? John, I don't care if you throw the dots or not. I just work here. I only wanted to put you wise. Put me wise for what? You must be hot. What do you mean? Ever since you came on the midway, that cop's been following you. I turned quick, and there he was. Just a plain cop, not 20 feet away. Looking as though he couldn't decide about me. I could almost see him thumbing through his mind, trying to figure where he'd seen my face before. I started down the midway, trying to keep from running. And he called after me. Hey, fellow, wait. I want to talk to you. I kept on going, I actually, but I didn't know he was calling me. A small crowd came out of one of the side shows, and I mingled with it. And then I saw a little shack, and the door had a little sign on it. Welcome. Yeah, that was for me. You have come for a reading? What? You have come to Madame Zara for a reading? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, a reading. Come with me into my inner room. Okay, okay. Right through this great Sit down here. Uh -huh. It is quiet here and dark. The mind can be at rest. Yeah, yeah, it's swell in here. You want just a reading of the card? Or are you in need of special counseling? No, no, just a card reading. That'll be okay. <laughs> She sure had a good act, that dame. First she had me shuffle the cards, then cut them three times toward me. Then she started spreading them face up on the little table. And then all of a sudden she stopped, and I saw her look up at me quickly. These cards, I hate them. They have been spiteful all day. Here, we will use this deck. She broke open a new deck, and then things seemed to go right. She told me all the good things that were going to happen to me. A new business venture, a trip across water, a letter with money in it. And when she was through... These cards have been very favorable for you. You are going to have a good year. That will be three dollars. Three dollars, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, say, I, I I didn't bring any money out with me. I, I left it in my room, but don't worry, I'll pay you. You think you are going to get away with this, honey? Madam Zara, are you inside? Cup. Now, look, lady, I'm holding a gun in my hand. Madam Zara! What is it? Did you see a young, heavy set guy in a black top coat come by this way in the last 15 minutes? I'm warning you. Why, why, why no, I have been back here giving this, giving this lady a reading. Lady, huh? Okay, he must be around here somewhere. He is gone. Now get out of here. Is there a back entrance to the shack? Yes, right through here. Okay. But first I am going to tell you what I really saw in those cards I threw away. Uh, save it for the yokels. I ain't interested. Twice it came up and it must be the truth. Shut up and tell me how to get out of here. You are going to die. But... What? Within three days you will be killed by a man with white hair. It was so funny I didn't know whether to bust out laughing or bust the old dame over the head. Yeah, she had it all figured out, even to the color of the guy's hair. I was going to be killed by a guy with white hair. <laughs> well, I got out through the back and hurried to my rooming house. Dave was waiting for me. You got a long-distance call a while ago. What? Nobody knows I'm here. Operator asked for Sam Gordon. Yeah, better not mess around with this. What difference does it make? She knows you're here. She said for you to call as soon as you got in. Operator 23. Go on, use the hall phone. Maybe it's a friend. I called operator 23, and she had a long-distance call for me, all right, in New York. But nobody knew I was here. What was going on? It took her a couple of minutes to complete the call, and I just stood there trying to figure out who it could be. Finally, she said she had my party. Hello, Sammy. Collins. I called you before. You were out. With all those cops looking for you, that's... Not very smart. What do you want? You didn't think I'd forgotten about you, did you, Sammy? How did you know I was here? I got ways of finding out. The reason I phoned, I've arranged for a guy to pay a little call on you to kind of settle things, you know? Yeah? Maybe you think I'm going to stay here and wait for your guy. No. That's why I called you. I know you'll start running. I want you to run. A man sweats when he runs, Sammy. And I like to think of you sweating. Of course, you could go to the cops. 
cops. But then that wouldn't be so good either, would it? Look, if you think I'm going to listen to you Wait with it... Wait a second. It... Don't hang up yet. I want to tell you something about the guy I hired to kill you. Kill me? You've heard of him. Yeah, he's really got a reputation for doing a job. Look, I, I'm hanging up, so save your breath. Let me tell you his name. Whitey Burke. Whitey... The fortune teller. <laughs> hung up the phone and went down the hall to Dave's room. You get your call, all right? Dave, you ever heard of a fellow named Whitey Burke? Yeah, I've heard of him. Well, you know most everything, so you might as well know this. That call was from Phil Collins in New York. He hired this Whitey Burke to, to kill me. Yeah? And if I were you, I'd run, not walk to the nearest police station. What are you talking about? If the cops get me, it means the chair. And what do you think it means if this Whitey gets you? Well, I'll take my chances. Suit yourself, but I want you out of here in ten minutes. Dave, I... I'm not turning this place into a shooting gallery. But look, how will I know him when I see him? What does he look like? I don't know. All I know is once Whitey Burke gets on to a guy... Okay, that's... okay, but give me time to find another hideout. Now that the cops have seen me, they'll be looking for me all over the city. That's your worry. Get out. I could see there was no use arguing with Dave. I went upstairs and started packing. In three days, you will be killed by a man with white hair. I checked my gun, slid it into my overcoat pocket. I could feel my heart go on a mile a minute. Within three days, you will be killed by a man with white hair. I had to stop thinking about that. I had to... Hey, police siren. Dave was in the hall. You better get out of here quick. Squad car's out in the street. But how? Through the window. Hurry. Ran back into my room and across to the window. It's only a ten-foot drop to the rear alley. I dropped the suitcase with the money to the ground, and then I lowered myself down. And as I straightened up, I saw someone standing in the shadows. He was walking toward me. I couldn't see much of him in the darkness. What do you want? couldn't move. It was like looking into the eyes of a snake. And then finally the spell broke. I crouched down and started running toward him. I caught him by surprise and he fell to the ground. I sprinted down the alley. I'd left the money, but I was safe. But for how long? I'll never forget that night. There seemed to be a cop on every corner and they were all looking for me. But they weren't alone. Whitey was looking for me, too, and he'd almost got me. I was going nuts trying to figure out what to do. I couldn't go back to Dave's. There was nobody else in Chicago I knew. I started walking the streets, ducking into doorways every time a siren sounded. So tired, every bone in my body ached. When I was ready to just give up and fall on the street, I saw this old deserted house. Across the front was a big sign I could read by the dim light of the street lamp. This property condemned. I staggered inside and dropped to the floor into a deep sleep. When I woke up, I could see the sky was turning gray. It was morning. And then I smelled tobacco smoke and I realized somebody was beside me. Pretty good place to hide out, eh? I turned to the voice. The man was crouched on one knee looking at me. He wasn't wearing a hat. And his hair was white as snow. Yeah, in the five years I've been on a bum, I've used this old house lots of times. <sighs> Why, uh, what's the matter? Uh, I thought you were somebody else. Want to smoke? I got to make you. No, no, I, I got to be gone. This is a good day to stay off the street. Well, what do you mean? Too many cops. They got this whole neighborhood roped off trying to find the guy who killed that big shot back east. All right? Sure. Look at this newspaper I picked up on the street. Look at this headline. Killer trapped on south side. See, here's the map of the neighborhood right here on page two. All this dark part is where the cops have already searched. Yeah. And this white part's where we are, where they still have to search. Not much white part left, is there, Sam? No, not much. 
Hey, how come you know my name? You look pretty bad. But there's still a resemblance with his picture. What do you think you're going to do about it? Nothing. I don't love cops. That's why I say you better stay right here. And what about eating? I'm so hungry my stomach hurts. You got any money? I can go out and buy something. All right. Got a little change. Now, let's see. A couple of quarters. About a buck altogether. Okay. I'll bring back some food. If the cops should start searching this house, there's plenty of room to hide. This is an old four-story flat. All right. But you better not try any double cross. Well, what makes you think I will? Maybe it's your white hair. Huh? Why, what do you mean? Ah, uh, nothing, nothing. Go on, get the food. And hurry back. <laughs> But the old guy didn't hurry back. He didn't come back that day at all. I didn't dare leave the house to look for him. All that day and all that night, squad cars kept racing up and down the block. Yeah, the white part on that map was getting smaller all the time. The funny thing, what scared me most, what just about drove me nuts, was thinking about Whitey looking for me. And all through that second day and the third night, I, I, I kept dozing off. And every time my eyes closed, I heard that voice. sleep again. Then I heard someone coming into the house. I sprang to my feet. It wasn't a cop. It was someone else. I couldn't see nothing in the dark. Maybe it was the old guy. Hey, Pop, is that you? Pop, answer me. Is that you, Pop? Whitey, I spun around and started running for the stairs. <laughs> I was on the fourth floor. Whitey was coming up the steps behind me. I ran down the hall. I saw an open door, and I ran inside and slammed the door shut after me. I tried to find a lock for the door, but there wasn't any. And I ran to the window. Four stories down the sidewalk. And I heard Whitey outside the door. What was I going to do? The door was opening. I couldn't stand it. Just waiting for him to kill me. I, I couldn't stand it. I couldn't... Ah! Yeah, that's it, Inspector. I guess I went nuts. The swan dive to the street looked better to me than my pal, Whitey. Yeah. Well, if it makes you feel any better, we caught Whitey when he's trying to leave that house. Too bad you never met him. You might not have jumped through the window. What do you mean? I don't think he'd have scared you half so much. If you'd have known his hair was black. What? Huh? You've seen a hundred guys like him, living their lives in gin mills and pool halls. Never getting any sunshine. Their skin is white as a shark's belly. Yeah, that's why they called him Whitey. He was just a pasty-faced punk. <laughs> How do you like that? The old dame with the cards was wrong from the word go. Me gonna be killed by a guy with white hair. <laughs> You think she'll be sore when she hears I killed myself? Huh? <laughs> nurse, nurse, come here. What is it? Uh, oh, he's dead. Poor little guy. Went nuts one night about a month ago over a poker game and ruined his life. He must have gone through a terrible ordeal since then. Certainly doesn't look like the newspaper pictures, does it? Look at him. Why, his hair's turned white as snow. Dark Venture, tonight's performance in the Mystery Playhouse, has been a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
Hey Weirdos! Our next Weirdo Watch Party is this Saturday, August 17th, with Weirdo family favorite Mistress Malicious and her crew from Mistress Peace Theater. This time, Mistress is bringing us a film from 2015 entitled Killer Piñata. A possessed piñata seeking to avenge the savagery that humanity has inflicted on his kind picks off a group of friends one by one in an unending night of terror. I'm gonna take a wild guess and say this is more comedy and less creeps, but we'll find out. The fun begins this Saturday night, August 17th at 7 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Mountain, 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch, just tune in at showtime and watch the movie with me and other Weirdo family members, and even join in the chat during the film for more fun. It's Mistress Malicious presenting Killer Piñata, this Saturday night, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. You can see a trailer for the film now and watch horror hosts and B-movies for free anytime on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash TV. See you Saturday! In this cave by the restless sea, we are met to call from out the past stories strange and weird. Bell keeper, pull the bell so all may know we are gathered again in the weird circle. Speak again their immortal tale. What was it? All right, then. What was it? What was it? Nobody knows. But the house was haunted by something or somebody. The boarders here at Mrs. Dimity's boarding house didn't believe in ghosts either, myself included. But we were curious about them. That's why we voted to move into the old brownstone house on 49th Street. And once we were in, we were still convinced that ghosts don't venture abroad in a New York tenement building. The only one who wasn't quite convinced that ghosts exist only in storybooks was old Mrs. Dimity herself. But her favorite rumor, young, handsome Ned Saunders, and myself, uh, I'm Dr. Hammond, we refused to believe the ghostly nonsense. Ann Mitchell, the young sculptress who lived there, was frankly curious, while the Countess Harkavy, a fortune teller of some renown and a psychic of questionable fame, was delighted at the idea of living in a haunted house. That was in a business way, of course. It was around 11 o'clock at night when the boarders, who were then assembled in that dark, dreary living room, first heard what some claimed was a ghostly presence. Listen to that, Dr. Hammond. I hear it, Ned. It's an uncommon sort of sound for the wind. That is not the wind, Dr. Hammond. It is the cries from the spirit world. I feel it in the marrow of my bones. Oh, say, Countess, can't you feel things in a more comfortable place? Bone structures always struck me as a most uncomfortable place to have a feeling going on. Listen, all of you. Listen. Oh, skip it. Ned, will you pass me that magazine on the shelf next to you? I think any kind of reading will be preferable to listening to old psychic ears rambling. Go ahead. Hey, you are, dear. You really think this house is haunted, Countess? Yes, I do. 
It would be a fortunate thing for your business if the United States of America could be made ghost conscious. Dr. Hammond, you will live to regret that remark. The Countess will take you seriously. I am serious. And talking of taking things seriously, when are you going to start taking me seriously, Anne? When you start to make a living, Ned. Oh, someday I hope I won't have to try and sell my sculptures. All art is conceived out of the fires of struggles. Well, I'm tired of struggling. Oh, if I could just create something out of the ordinary for an art exhibit, I could make a couple of hundred dollars. I've been working three months for an idea and I haven't done a thing. My poor dear Anne, as long as you doubt the extraordinary, how can you create it? She's got you there, Anne. Yes, she has, Dr. Hammond. <laughs> well, what would you suggest as a good subject for Anne to sculpt, Countess? Well, a denizen of the other world, perhaps? Oh, sure. That's rather a hot place for a girl to venture in order to sculpt the devil, Shh. isn't it? Don't speak so lightly of his satanic highness. No one knows where the devil's hand may be next. How about sculpting me, Anne? I'm an extraordinary young man. That you are, darling. Extraordinarily broke, at any rate. Oh, the woes of the world revolve on that ugly stuff called money. People take money much too seriously, Ned. Well, frankly, Dr. Hammond, if I had some of it, I wouldn't take it at all seriously. I'd scatter it around the world like a veritable windmill. Oh, frivolity. That's your trouble, my dear friends. Frivolity. You feed on it. Here in this very house is a poor earthbound spirit, and yet you ignore it. Come, Countess, you don't expect us to take it seriously. I expect nothing. What do you expect us to do? Call a spirit in and ask him to sit for me? Possibly, Anne. Possibly. Come, come, Countess. You're joking. I have never been more serious in my life. I think we ought to hold a seance and command the spirits to enter the room. That would be interesting, at least scientifically so. Oh, nonsense, Doctor. Besides, Mrs. Dimity would never stand for it. Ever since she moved us into this house, she's been scared stiff of the very idea of spirits. Have you seen the amulet she's been wearing? Yes. <laughs> she carries it around like a sword. Why don't we ask her? <laughs> oh, we were just talking about you, Mrs. Dimity. Oh, dear. I tell you, I, I just can't stand being alone in my room. I just know something was in there with me, Anna. I just know it. The spirits probably have been attracted to you, Mrs. Dimity. I've always felt you're strongly psychic. Oh, don't say it, Countess. Don't even think about it. It was all a mistake moving into this house. All a mistake. I've just never been as nervous. Dr. Hammond, feel my pulse. Feel it. It's practically non-pulsed, so to speak. <laughs> well, I wouldn't take it seriously, Mrs. Dimity. We all know there are no such things as spirits. You see, we've been talking about the ghost for so long that at times we half believe, but that's purely imagination. It wasn't imagination at all, Dr. Hammond. You know very well there are only five of us living here. You four were downstairs and I was alone upstairs and, oh, I did hear footsteps in the hall. I, I opened the door and I felt something cold touch me. Ah, you see, I knew it. Ah! Oh, listen. Oh, oh, it came from upstairs. Listen, all of you. Ah, uh, and was that also the wind, Dr. Hammond? I don't know, Countess. What do you think, Ned? Well, I think the Countess' idea of a seance is a good practical suggestion. I'm all for it. A seance? Oh, dear. Uh, yes, let's give it a try. Uh, well, we're all agreed. Yes, uh, come, come on, on, let's. I think it's a good idea. You're in idea. charge, Countess. Now tell us what to do. Well, now, for the first thing, bring your chairs into a circle, please. Right. Oh, dear. I think I'm going to find this show. I don't think. Now, hold hands. Right. Will someone turn off the lights? I'll get the switch. Good. Now we're in the dark. Oh, Quiet, please. Quiet while I summon the spirits. It is midnight, O oh spirits. Midnight. Enter the portals of our room and speak to us. Speak to us. We are gathered to commune with you who have passed on. Withhold not your secrets. Speak. Speak. It is I, Countess Harkavy, asking you to descend to this mortal plane. Answer me. Answer me. If, uh, if my Uncle Ezekiel's in the room and wants to talk to me, I'd talk to him, Countess. Yes, Mrs. Dimity. Ned, stop squeezing my hand. I'm not squeezing your hand, eh? Well, whatever you're doing, stop doing it. I'm not it. doing anything. 
Ouch, doggone it. What's the matter with you, Anne? Well, you're so coy, pinching me now. I'm not pinching you. My hands are in my lap. Well, who's ever sitting next to me? Stop it. Dr. Hammond. I'm sitting across from you, Anne. Mrs. Dimity. Oh, dear. I wouldn't have the courage to squeeze anybody's hand at this point. Ouch. Well, whoever it is... Turn on the lights, somebody. Turn on the lights. No. Somebody's got hold of my no, hand. No, don't turn on the lights. The spirits have entered the room and are attracted to you, Anne. To you. Oh, please, please turn on the lights, please. I'll do it, Anne. I'll do it. Oh, let go. Let... Oh, the... Who? Oh. There's nobody sitting next to you. That's a vacant chair. But I felt it. Anne, did you imagine it? Imagine what? That somebody squeezed my hand? I imagine nothing. Look. Look at my hand. And tell me that's imagination. What's it, darling? What? Dr. Hammond, look. Hmm? Her hand is bruised. Hmm. Yes, it is. Pretty badly bruised. Countess, where were you sitting? Exactly where I'm sitting now, Dr. Hammond, and I haven't moved. You had your chance to do something extraordinary, Anne, but you muffed it. A pity is all I can say. A great pity. The seance is ruined. But, Countess, wait a minute. What for? To try another seance and have you become hysterical all over again? Good night. Dr. Hammond, is it possible that I really was holding the hand of something or... Anything's possible, Anne, but not very probable. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. I said not very probable, Mrs. Dimity. I think perhaps the Countess has been playing a trick on all of us. It's a cute trick, Doctor. A pretty difficult one. If she wasn't playing a trick, she shouldn't have been so upset when you turned on the lights, Ned. Oh, Doctor, I think you've got a point there. Nothing like a good dash of logic to take the cold chills out of my spine. Well, how could the Countess do it, Doctor? Well, Mrs. Dimmer, the psychic phenomena is the Countess's business. After all, she makes a living out of calling imaginary spooks from the outer world. I don't think it's very nice of us to try and pry into her secrets. I hope you're right, Doctor. I do hope you're right. Well, I wouldn't worry, Mrs. Dimity. Well, I'm going upstairs to bed. I've had enough spooks to last me for years. Oh, wait for me, Mrs. Dimity. I'll go up with you. Oh. Good night, Ned. Good night, Anne. Good night, Dr. Hammond. See you in the morning. Good night, my dear. And don't worry about the spooks. They're purely harmless make-believe. Oh, dear. I'll never sleep a wink again. Well, Doctor, what's the... Tongue and the cheek look. Oh. <laughs> Ned, I'm afraid we've had our first touch of real psychic phenomena tonight. But you just said. I that... didn't want to frighten the women. Then you believe this house is haunted? Haunted? Mm, well, I don't like the phrase, but in essence, that's the idea. I was wondering if you'd be interested in trying an experiment with me tonight. Certainly, Doctor, anything. Well, suppose you and I spend the next few nights down here. We'll turn off the lights and wait. Just wait. Perhaps we can invite some trouble. We waited that night through without sleeping, but nothing extraordinary happened, except for the fact that Mrs. Dimity's rocking chair kept rocking all night long, creaking and squeaking as it moved. But the wind could have been responsible for that. The next night and the next and the one after that, we kept our nightly vigil, creeping up to our rooms like thieves just before daylight broke so that nobody would suspect our secret experiment. On the fifth night of our wait, we heard the rocking chair creaking, creaking, creaking. Doctor. Yes, Ned? That rocking chair couldn't be moved by wind tonight. There isn't a breath of air stirring. I noticed that, Ned. I wonder... Listen. Yes, the creaking stopped. Same as usual. I'll try to get some sleep. I can't. I'm as nervous as a cat over this whole thing. Yes, I am jittery, too. Ouch, let me... What's Why the matter, you... Ned? I don't know. Somebody's attacked me. I... Help me, doctor. Yeah. Help me. I... I... It's got its arms around my throat. I... There, I feel it. We'll find out who this ghost is in a short time. There, I've got his arms, Ned. My throat. Let go of my throat, you... I... There. It's free. Can you hang on to him alone, Doctor? I think so. But he's as strong as an ox. <coughs> no, you don't. Listen to him, will you, Doctor? His voice certainly doesn't sound human. Turn on the lights, Ned, while I hang on to him. We'll find out who this practical prankster is. I'm afraid to let him go, Doctor. I can handle him, Ned. You turn on the lights. Hurry, Ned. Hurry. All right. Of course. There you are. No, he is. No. Doctor, where is he? He's right in front 
I've got him by the arms. I'm, I'm hanging on to it. Well, this is amazing. Amazing, Doctor. Well, we can't see it. It's invisible. Uh, help me, Ned. He's trying to escape. <laughs> I, help me. If I could only see him. There we are. I've got it. I've got it. Well, what is it, Doctor? What is this thing? was it? I didn't know as I held the grisly thing in my arms. It struggled and sobbed and moaned exactly as a beast would struggle and moan. An invisible beast. That was the horror of it. An invisible beast. I sent Ned to the basement of the old brownstone to get some stout rope. At least we could prevent this horror from escaping. That's what I thought then. Well, Ned returned shortly from the basement and opened the door. There you are, Dr. Hammond. Oh, quickly, Ned. Bind its legs. I... I can't hang on to it much longer. Not as young as I used to be. All right, Dr. Almanic. Somehow I... Try to hold him on the floor. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, there you are, Ned. Now, quickly. It's feet are still for the minute. There. I've got the rope about uh, Look. Yeah? A perfect loop around nothing but empty air. Hold him and I'll bind the rope around him. Oh, quickly, Ned. There we are. That covers his feet. And I'll bring it up here and around his legs. Here, give me the rope and I'll bind his hand. All right. We're getting him bound up like an Egyptian mummy. There, that does it. Ah, what a relief to be able to let that awful thing go. All right, I'll take the rope now, Doctor, and bind it to this chair. He won't get away now, I'll guarantee that. It isn't very large, is it? No, about the size of a small boy. Yeah, but what is it? Have you ever encountered anything like this before? Well, frankly, Ned, never. Look at my hands, bitten and bruised. I wonder if I'll ever be able to move them again. What are we going to do with the darn thing now? I don't think that's our responsibility, Ned. I think we'd better call the boarders together and let them in on the secret. Would you like me to get them, Doctor? Uh, yes, wake them up. But don't tell them why. Just ask them to come down here, and I'll throw this rug over the chair so that they won't see the rope right away. Ah, uh, don't ask so many questions, everybody. Dr. Hammond will explain everything. Good evening, Dr. Hammond. Have you possibly discovered that psychic phenomena does exist? Come in, Countess. Come in, everybody. Don't be afraid, Mrs. Dimity. Oh, well, what's that? I'll explain it in a minute. Explain it, Dr. Hammond? Uh, sit down, everybody, please. Uh, no, Mrs. Dimity, not in the rocking chair. Oh, you mean... I'm afraid we're in for a revelation this evening. Uh, Ned, please close the door. Right. Strange are the ways of the world. Yes, Countess. The ways of the world are very strange. Mrs. Dimity and the Countess has been correct about this house. There is something in it. Oh, what do you mean? There's nothing to be frightened of, Mrs. Dimity. Oh, spirits are often kind. Indeed, they're friendlier than many mortals. This isn't exactly a spirit, Countess. What do you mean? Exactly what I say. It's a beast of some kind. Oh, the doctor, is it in this room? Mrs. Dimity, please. Yes, Anne, it's in this room, in that rocking chair. I threw a rug over it. Oh, unfortunate spirit. If you wish, Countess, remove the rug. Yes, of course. Why, why, where, where is it? It's there. You can see the ropes being held in place by it. What kind of a hoax are you trying to play on me, Dr. Hammond? It is not a hoax. There's a living, breathing something bound in that chair. But it's invisible. Oh, invisible? Why, why, that's incredible. It's more than incredible. Would, uh, would you mind if I touched it? I don't see why I should. It's not my beast. The problem is, what are we going to do with it? What do you suggest, Mrs. Dimity? Mrs. Dimity! Well, she's painted, Dr. Hammond. I'll get a smelling salts right here in the desk drawer. <gasps> oh, I felt it. I felt it, Anne. I felt it. A captured spirit. I must tell my co-worker, Dr. Zarkoff, right away. He'll be so thrilled, so thrilled. I'm not sure that we ought to tell anybody about it. Are you, Doctor? Ned's quite right. We should not. Oh, but Dr. Sarcox is the only living person constantly in touch with the spiritual night and day. Day and night, constantly. The smelling salt should be in here someplace. Oh, here they are. Until we find out exactly what it is, I don't think we ought to divulge the secret. 
Heaven knows what we've stumbled into. You're right, Ned. Here, Mrs. Dimity, take a deep breath of this. And how do you propose going about finding out what it is? Breathe deeply, Mrs. Dimity. Oh. Well, I was thinking it might be possible for Anne to make a plaster cast on it. Oh, that's a gay idea, Ned. Breathe deeply, Mrs. Dimity. You'll be all right. That's quite a good idea, as a matter of fact. Oh, you'll hold it while I make a cast, huh? If it happens to bite me with a pair of invisible teeth, that'll be my word. No. No, being a doctor, I shall use a little chloroform and put it to sleep for a while. We'll be able to make a perfect cast. Mr. Dimity, are you all right? Oh, I'll never be all right again. Well, Anne, are you willing to give it a try? Oh, I suppose so, Ned. I'll prepare the plaster right away. There we are, Anne. The chloroform has worked perfectly. Whatever it is, it's asleep. Before you start with the plaster, I should like to listen to his heart with the stethoscope. Certainly, Doctor. Uh-huh. Hmm. Normal. A little faster than is normal for a human being, but maybe we're not dealing with a human being. Yes, Doctor, that's very possible. Ned, would you hand me that container near you? What do we have? There you are. Thanks, Ned. Well, Dr. Hammond, are you ready? Yes, Anne, whenever you are. Oh, we might as well start. It's two o'clock. We ought to be through by seven. And so Anne started to work to cover that invisible form with moist plaster. We watched her spellbound. The hideousness of the rough object which soon met our eyes was appalling. Anne's hands shook perceptibly as she forced herself to complete what she had started. Minutes changed into hours. The mold was completed and we had a rough idea of this figure. Then Anne allowed the mold to dry. By morning, we had a rough facsimile of the invisible beast. How can I describe what it looked like when it looked like nothing so much as a demon out of hell itself? Yes, shaped like a man with long, sinewy arms, but it was small, only four feet or so high. Its muscular development was amazing, and the face, the face looked like a cannibal's, a demon. Cruel, tiny eyes, a tiny nose, and a twisted, long a horribly long mouth and sharp, shiny teeth. The first rays of light broke through the window, and I realized that the effects of the chloroform were wearing off. And... Watch out, ladies, away. I got him, Doctor. You better help me. Yes, of course. Here. Here, we'll hold him together. Right. And, and... Yes, Dr. Hammond. We'll hold him down, and you bind his legs with the cord. Yeah. Get that rope around his legs. Ah, okay. oh, good girl, Anne. That's it. Oh! Your arm, darling, it's bleeding. Don't mind my arm. Just bind the legs. Okay. Hurry up, Anne. Uh, that's the girl. Now flip the rope around him and pull it good and tight. All right. There we are. Give me the rope, Anne. I'll secure his arm. Ned, look at your arm. Oh, Doctor, he's badly bitten. Don't bother about me now, darling. We can't let this beast loose on humanity. That face you've done, Anne, looks like the face of a man-eater. Yeah, it does. Give me a hand, Dr. Hammond. We'll put it back in the chair yeah. and tie it. Yeah. Okay, Ned. Now, one, two, lift. <sighs> there. Now, tie the darn thing there. <laughs> What do you think we ought to do with it now? I don't know. You're the doctor. No? I think we all need some sleep. First, I'll tend to that arm of yours, Ned, and then we'll leave the thing here for a while. Doctor, do you think we dare leave it here quite safely? Well, judging from the way Ned's got it tied up, I think so. Not even a spirit could get out of those ropes. Come on, Ned. I want to take a look at that arm of yours. Oh, I'm so tired. I'll leave the little statue in here till morning. You know, doctor, that makes an interesting study, doesn't it? Yes, quite an interesting one. Extraordinary piece of work, one might say. Well, good night, Anne. Come on, Ned, let's get that arm bandaged. We'll all think more clearly in the morning. We thought we could think more clearly after some sleep. And so the days went by. Ned and Anne and I stayed with that invisible beast constantly. I took test after test. Its heart condition, its breathing... Every test I took baffled me completely. For this invisible beast reacted to every test exactly as a reptile would react. Or to be more specific, a python. A type of snake which swallows an animal or a man whole and then digests it. As the days passed, we realized that since this was living matter, it must eat. We tempted it with every kind of food imaginable. Tried force feeding it. But the animal never swallowed one bite of food. Then one evening, all of us were collected in the living room when those horrible sounds started. 
I tell you, Ned, I, I, it's hungry. And darling, we've tried feeding. But you've got to get it out of this house. I can't take it any longer. <laughs> Captain, a spirit will evoke the anger of the gods. My advice to you is to let it go. That's not very good advice, Countess. Whatever this is, it would be fairly dangerous news. No, isn't there anything we can feed it? It must be suffering horribly, Doctor. No food or water for two weeks. Yes, Anne, there is something we can feed it, but unfortunately or fortunately, we can't. What are you talking about, Doctor? Human flesh, Ned. This creature is a man-eater, an invisible man-eater. There's only one thing for us to do. Call the police and the medical society and turn it over to them. There's nothing more we can do. Oh, you'll regret this, Doctor. You'll regret it. You can't evoke the anger of a spirit world without payment in full. Anne, will you make the call? Certainly, Doctor. I'll go with you, darling. Don't tell them anything about it. Just ask them to come over here immediately. And so, gentlemen, Anne called you and brought you over here. I've told you the complete story of the monster from the very beginning. Well, Dr. Hammond, as a member of the police force, I don't mean to doubt you. But where is this invisible monster? It died of hunger ten minutes before you arrived, Sergeant. Well, where is it? On the floor, here, next to my foot. Huh? You can feel it even if you can't see it. Here, put your hand down here. All right. Yes, yeah, Sergeant, feel this. It feels like a dead man. Yeah, I tell you, it does. Oh, well, uh, uh, sure, Doctor. What kind of a trick are you trying to play on us? Trick, Sergeant? Take my word for it, it's no trick. You felt it yourself. Ah, uh, many people know how to make a mass of material appear invisible. Chemistry can give you a lot of explanations of that kind of a hoax. It's no hoax, gentlemen, on my word of honor. It's no hoax. Ah, uh, tell us a better story. Come on, boys, let's get out of yeah, here. Let's get out of here. We enjoyed your fairy tale, Doctor, but we can't swallow that one. But, whole. gentlemen, ask any one of us in this room. I swear to you, it's the truth. Look in the corner at that statuette. That's an exact replica of the invisible beast. Ah, now I get it. You're trying to get some free publicity for the art exhibition at the museum. No, gentlemen. I made that plaster cast myself from the invisible monster. Dr. Hammond's telling you the truth. Oh, yeah? Well, if it's the truth, what was it? What was it? Frankly, gentlemen, I don't know what it was. From the time-worn pages of the past, you have heard, What Was It? Bellkeeper, toll the bell. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression 
addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio.